You lovely people. Here we are oh. for another open bar. Yay! Yay. <laughs> Do this. <laughs> yeah, I see a lot oh. of channel members in the chat now as well. That's hey. a new thing that we just rolled out today. Um, I've been thinking about doing it for a while and people kept asking me about it. And so I decided, okay, we'll do it. So uh, we're in the process of adding more and more emojis for you guys to throw into it. We've got Vomiting Terry in. We've got Sam Neil screaming. Uh, we've got The Message. Uh, we've got the we've got the don't know uh, and yeah there'll be plenty more on the way so um, yeah we'll, we'll stand by for that but yeah thank you for so many people who've already signed up for that very much appreciate it uh, very cool stuff um, but hey we're not here to talk about that we're here to talk about the wonderful world of entertainment Mahler what do you think Absolutely. about that Absolutely oh so many developments so many things to discuss yes, so many shows that have come out. Yeah, <laughs> Hollywood's a buzz with activity right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, there is a few that's the that's been happening over the past week. Some good, some bad, uh, some just like hilarious. But uh, we'll get right into it. And uh, I think the best thing to do is start bringing our guests in so we can talk. All right then, do it. Well, first and foremost, we need our our co-host for the evening. We've got Smokey, the critical doggo. Yes. He's just as excited about Ahsoka as we are. Yeah, I heard he's got some very controversial opinions about this. Well, that's the thing. He shoots from the hip and he just tells it like it is. Consequences be damned, because that's how mm -hmm. Greyhounds roll. So I uh, I appreciate that. Um, but, well, we also need humans that can talk. So we yeah, suppose, yeah. <laughs> bring in our first guest. Uh, it is former TV network, bleh, network executive. <laughs> I'll try that one again. Uh, yeah, former TV network executive Paul Chateau, who's going to give us the well, the industry view and a lot of the stuff we're going to be discussing tonight. Hello, sir. Welcome back to the bar. Uh, it's nice to nice to be here and not barred. But I I heard your accent and I, initially I thought you were the sports dude from Scotland with Mabel and uh, and Olive. Uh, <laughs> So, I'm sorry, I think I've been misled. I thought oh, this is going to be great. We're going to talk about Mabel and Olive, and I mean is... we can. <laughs> it's My all you scots all you scots people sound the same Yo, well, yeah I've been, so i've been told although i would say get an ed a person from edinburgh and get a person from glasgow and oh. put them in the same room and you'll notice a difference I would oh, a huge huge difference in fact i did travel from edinburgh to to glasgow and the glaswegian accent is 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 very very different it's uh it's baffling to all of us you know, it's it's like this. It's like in uh, it's like in Snatch when they start pe uh, talking in Pikey. And you're just like, yeah, okay, sure, fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, you have a wonderful country. I've I I've crisscrossed it. I I haven't been to the Upper Hebrides or whatever, but uh, we did get to Dune Castle, which was the highlight. Oh, okay, nice. Yeah, you've been pretty far up then, so that's all right. Um, but yeah, it gets a bit scary once you get up to the the real north of Scotland. That's when people, yeah, the weirdos start turning crazy. <laughs> but it's <laughs> thank you for inviting me. It's it's always great to be here. You guys are are wonderful, and and I love your commentary, and and I appreciate to be on the show. No, oh, thanks, man. Mm -hmm. um, we've also got Gary, who's joining us from live from Paris, which just sounds incredibly glamorous. That's great. Yeah, <laughs> live Paris, from. And... Is he here? Uh, not yet. He's on. Okay. The, he's on his way. He knew. He said he was going to be slightly late tonight. He's got a few things he has to do first. Um, but yeah, we'll bring him in um, as soon as he appears. Um, and we've also got Echo Chamberlain, who's with us all the way from New Zealand, um, on that lovely New Zealand internet connection, which seems to be letting him down slightly. Um, he's having some issues backstage. I think when uh, Jacinda quit, she got really pissy and just pulled the plug on the entire Wi-Fi system yeah. in New Zealand. If Damn. I can't have it, no one can. <laughs> <laughs> just, like there's one plug somewhere in that country. <laughs> Pull it. Like, no. No other skinny woman is going to take my place. 
uh but yeah once he's once he's got it sorted out we'll bring him right in because i think he's trying to fix it right now but i say we just get fired right into our discussion because there's things that we were going to talk about tonight i'm very um, excited and- yeah First and foremost, I guess, a um, bit of good news. There's a good show that's appeared on Netflix called mm-hmm. One Piece. And I uh, don't know about you guys, but I've been quite enjoying it so far. Um, yeah, it's been really good fun. Um, I don't know a huge amount about the manga and the anime that it spawned that then led to this adaptation, but uh, it feels very much in keeping with the tone of anime. Um, you know, very over-the-top characters, like larger than life. Um, fun um, gravity physics defying action sequences uh, and intercut with like really good um, dramatic interpersonal moments and it just feels like a really fun vibrant show it feels like everything that Cowboy Bebop tried to be and should have been but failed to be so I, I've been late I've been really enjoying it it's I, I think it's a great show it's a great fun show and it's it, 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 amongst all the turgid content that we've had to dig through it's just fun to see something built on the foundation of joy <laughs> yeah i uh that, that's I, honestly what it feels like yeah they, they really seem like they had a lot of fun making this i was asked to see it by as for the sake of real beauty just the first episode and i decided i would watch the whole thing after i saw the first episode because mm. i was like you know what i want to give this a full shot and see what it has to offer because the first episode convinced me of a couple things now i assume you guys noticed this as well but just um the way I would describe this show to a lot of people, uh, I said this would be like a really weird take for me to start with, but whatever. It's uh, finally a normal show. And you might be <laughs> like, what? Normal? <laughs> it's like, so the, the, the paint job that this has, the absolutely insane world and insane physics and all these crazy kooky characters and stuff. Sure, that, that's, that's all there. But like underneath, this is the most normal storytelling that I've yes. seen in a long yeah. time. And I've missed it. Just... Um, it, it, the, the structure was downright like you, you could find this in b- many books that'll tell you how to make a story. It's like first scene, introduce a vague understanding of the world and a hook that there's pirates treasure and we're all going to go get it. It's like, okay. Second scene this is like main character establishes wants and needs straight away. Second scene, like how does the character bump into adversity event? Now we've got conflict straight away. I remember um, by the time you hit like the stuff with the, the lady Alvida, I think it is. And, uh, the, you know, the other characters and stuff, I, I was like, holy shit, we're like 10 minutes in. I feel like I've yeah. watched a shit ton, and I was like, no, it's because I've been trained so hard right now by, like, Disney shows where nothing happens for the whole season. Yeah, It's like, oh, I forgot what it was to have something to chew on, to have characters that, you know, have things to do and fucking investments in different shit, and watching a kid cut himself up because he's uh, got inspired by his father figure that scars show you like the strength of a man and stuff and he's misinterpreted misunderstood it and then having the dad so to speak say that uh it's not about having scars it's about the lessons behind them and you didn't earn that one and i was just like what an interesting thing to say yeah i was just thinking about it for a while as the scenes were going on i was just like oh i think i think the person who made this gave a shit Mm-hmm. It, so, it's um... all like with every character though like they don't just establish them as like they're a one note personality like they're just an archetype and that's all they ever are throughout the show like you learn more and more about them what drives them what motivated them to go on this quest what do they want why do they want it uh and it's it's done so well that you actually care you're interested to learn more about them uh and again it's so it feels like a rarity now to actually be invested in characters that you're interested to look to know more about uh, it's great. Yeah. The the other thing that they do, which is very much comic book oriented compared to a whole ton of fantasy stuff that we've seen, is that uh, the show is not about get them getting their power. They already have it. Now, that is fantastic because we get to see them use it immediately. But in traditional anime, they all start where the person is at level one, but thinks they're great and get defeated constantly. So none of them are Mary Sue's. All of them are overconfident, which is a traditional anime trope, but they get their ass kicked regularly as they go up and gain more capabilities. That's what's going to happen here. I'm, I'm fairly certain. Um, Yeah. And, and the fact that there's no love interests and things like that, we're not, uh, there's no uh, people aren't being droopy about stuff and 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 uh, to me one of the and I'm going to hit a spoiler here uh, one moment that brought a tear to my eye was and you've seen this all right critical 
You've seen them I've all? got like two episodes to go. I didn't quite but I think I think I, 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 I think you've seen the one at the um uh, in the uh, uh, oh god damn where they have tombstones <laughs> what's that called the uh the graveyard grave, graveyard thank yeah. you <laughs> when oh, you hit boy. when you hit 69 you forget but when um nami uh i think been... that's episode seven which means he probably hasn't seen it okay so i won't oh, i won't okay. spoil it i won't spoil it so that's a phenomenal scene like it really took me off guard and uh, it brought you know the, the fact that they're willing to bring humanity uh to it and the fact that people characters are able to break out of the the um the walls they've built for themselves uh, it's really really well, well done that way no there's like this is something that's been reflected in chat here that they filled me really hard with nami i thought she was going to be another ray sue uh super cocky tough independent that's girl right. boss. what a surprise when we got to see more yeah yep. exactly <laughs> like there's that's a lot my more point yeah with her character and you know this is uh this, I guess, is one of the hallmarks of uh, the fact that it's from Japan and it's based on on their culture. Like the girls don't automatically win everything, and they're not better at everything no. like you would expect from a Disney production or whatever. Um, and I, I think a lot of that comes down to the fact that the original manga writer had the rights to this, and he retained creative control when Netflix picked it up, and so he was actually able to force them to rewrite a whole bunch of scenes that they want you to do because he was not satisfied with how it treated the characters. And I'm pretty sure the only reason it's as good as it is, is because he insisted that it be done his way. Uh, in which case, God damn, we need more people like that for sure. Um, yeah. There's, there's even a scene that like, I think Mola referenced this once before when we were chatting um, when Zorro, like the, the flashbacks to him when he's training, it's like, he, yeah. he's fighting like a fellow student. She's like the best and he can't beat her. And she's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I can beat you right now as a girl, but eventually you're going to be a man. And I, it doesn't matter how hard I train, you're going to be bigger and faster right. and stronger than I can ever be. And you're just going to be better and you're going to beat me. And I can't stop that. And I thought, God damn, the feminists out there must be melting down when, <laughs> when a line like that gets said. It's like that just destroys their entire worldview. <laughs> like, but it's true. You know, the, the show is like honest about that. Um, but it doesn't it doesn't undermine her character. It just means that they approach her in a different way, which again is just uh, it's good character writing. Yeah, uh, and Zorro is very much like the uh, the Spanish uh, sword wielder in um, uh, again, my brain has gone for uh, names of movies. So the Pr Princess Bride. Yeah, he's very much like that. Where he has he's got a swashbuckler. He's a swashbuckler, and he's got supreme confidence in himself. But then he, when he gets up against the world's greatest swordsman mm. he loses but there's a bond between them where the guy says hey you know what um you're cool i'm not going to kill you right now and that seemed like such a manga thing to do it totally like, you've you've impressed me i'm not going to kill you totally Come back when you're stronger and we'll yeah fight again so, like, oh, so but cool. <laughs> but the, 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 it didn't feel like i mean to me it felt like i want to see the next fight now yeah i i, I didn't feel cheated in the space of like just a couple of minutes, you've established really st strong stakes for his character. That like right. his vow to this girl uh, that he thinks he's lost is that uh, he's going to become the greatest sword fighter in the world, and he has to defeat this guy in order to do it. And he gets his ass handed to him the first yeah. time he takes him on, and, and that was refreshing. Yeah, Mihawk, Mihawk hands him his his ass, and he was good in that. And yeah. the guy who played Buggy the Clown. Oh, he's great fun. Wasn't this, he? This, a lot of this show has things that I don't think would ever work if not for the actors really going for it and being yes. and the key word for the part of the show's success, sincere. Everybody is taking this for what it is. Nobody's standing around going, huh, how weird was that? Yeah. Oh, wow, look at that. Ain't that stupid? Oh, wow, that guy's got a big hat. That guy's got funny facial hair. Oh, look at that color of your hair. <laughs> Just walking around being like, nudge, nudge, audience. I'm in on it with you. I think this is weird, too. No writers are doing that for this. They're like, no, nah, this is our world. Like it or leave. Yeah. Yeah, you've got one of the the, the main uh, the guy who's head of the, uh, the troops uh, who wears this weird dog hat with flaps with teeth at the at the top. And you're going, OK, he's supposed to be a badass guy. What's he doing with that weird 
felt cap on. Yeah. There's so much of that. Like, yes. everything about it, like, on the face of it should make no sense and should make the whole thing just a complete laughing stock. You know, the, the set design, the world that they've created, yeah. it's like 18th century pirates, but also you've got, like, um, you know, inter international telephone calls and like, <laughs> electricity. You've got neon signs in bars and stuff. Like, there's just, like, it's just this crazy mishmash of different eras and different technologies. Yes, over slugs. Stuff. International telephone calls over slugs. Yeah, over slugs. <laughs> it's like, yep. how do they work? Don't know. It doesn't matter. Um, but, yeah, like you say, the attitude is very much like, well... This is the crazy world we've created, but the characters are not in on the joke. They take it seriously because Correct. this yeah. is what they live in. So you either accept it or just watch something else, really. Now, now, if they brought space whales into this, we would have accepted it. This is one of the things that bugged me with Ahsoka, <laughs> is that, that those space oh, whales we'll talk were very... talk about Ahsoka. Don't those worry. Were, those were very manga. Yeah. And wha what? How? <laughs> Anyways, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. No, there's just such joy. The characters were well drawn. Um, and, and I made the point in my video where I actually thought that this was an easier, except for the fact that it needed more, but it requires more budget than one point, uh, than um, Cowboy Bebop. Cowboy Bebop, uh, you know, this, this was a fantastical world that was basically pirates and guns and swords. Yeah. Someone told me later on they're going to have lasers and, and stuff like that. But for the most part, it wasn't a future world that they were trying to duplicate. It was very real, the fantasy world that they created, whereas Cowboy Bebop is in the future, and they they didn't have the budget to create the kind of future that was in the the uh, the anime, which, you know, that's actually Cowboy Bebop was much more harder to translate to uh, live action, I think, than uh, One Piece. I mean, I, I in some ways, yeah, like... In other ways, like, well, when you're dealing with um, sea monsters and, like, giant, like, um, pirate ships and stuff, like, there, there's a lot of visual effects that were needed for this in order to make it work. Uh, in Cowboy Bebop, you could have a lot of just people walking down derelict city streets and stuff. You could potentially do it that way. They obviously chose to do it a different way. Yeah, and, and, and in the one scene in the first episode where the they were in that dusty Mexican kind of Cuban town uh, in the anime they still have beat up futuristic hovering cars in the live action. They put fucking yellow Camaros in. Yeah. <laughs> so they put muscle cars in and I'm thinking, okay, no, they've lost it. They just, they would have been better off with no cars at all. Yeah. It just took me out of the, the show, but I know Cowboy Bebop really well, the anime, but I, I don't know one piece, the anime. So I, I could have been polluted that way. Mm -hmm. uh, I I was going to say as well. I really want to give props to the actor who played uh, Luffy, oh, because his his ability to switch, because he's obviously like his standard persona is just this like smiling, happy go lucky, freewheeling adventurer, and it would be easy to think, well, that's all there is to him. He's just like you know, um, he just takes life as it comes. But like he's he can have moments where he gets real serious, and the actor just absolutely just turns on a dime. To, to give you that uh he can give you real gravitas moments and i think that was just um a brilliant brilliant to see yeah i was worried and in this first scene that i was like oh i'm not gonna get a character that like doesn't match the world at all am i like he's gonna walk around in it as though he's a god or something what's, what's the reason going on here and as soon as i got the the rubber power thing i was like oh he has the power to be nice he, like he it's not only something that he believes in as we get from the uh the past scenes but that he can get away with like treating people well because when they attack him, they'll often fail. And like, yeah. you know, this this woman that tries to kill him straight away, he dodges what, like seven of her attacks and then says, okay, enough. <laughs> Punches her right into oblivion. Like, it's it, it a sense <laughs> of like, this, this is fun, but like, you're a horrible person. <laughs> like, well, so we got to stop you. I love that scene. I think it's in episode five where, you know, they're in this sort of manor house with the girl who's getting poisoned and the, the butler and stuff. Yes. And, um, I think Kobe and the other Marines show up and he's, he just like gets real serious at one point And he's like, look, I know you have a job to do, but don't get in my way. And it's like the actor just absolutely nails that moment. It's like, okay, you know, he's, he's got this persona, but at the same time, if you fuck with him or his friends, he will ruin your entire day. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just thought, yeah, nice one. And the other thing too, that was really neat is, you know, we all know what's coming and often, 
uh, it's not the ending that is a surprise, but the journey to the ending. We know how a court scene is going to end. We know how a sports movie is going to end. We we all know that stuff because we're old and cynical and all that stuff. But what a joy it was to just sit there and go, how are they going to deal with um, a buggy? How are they going to deal with the butler? How are they like, I was just waiting to see what inventive way uh, they're going to get out of it, if they're going to get out of it at all. And it's nice to be surprised for a change. That buggy conclusion where they throw it all through all his parts into different boxes was just yeah. fantastic. And he's just like a head with like two <laughs> like hands. <laughs> oh, I'm going to get you. It was a totally <laughs> satisfying way to deal with buggy. Logical. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and they give, oh, um, they give everyone stuff in the episode. There's never anyone that's like left behind. At least it feels that way. Like when we've got the final confrontation with like the, the butler, many characters are in that room. But it's like uh, they give Zorro the two um, sort of subordinates, yeah, the underlings. and they manage to create an action scene with them that's like got some really decent choreography and clarity. Something that I really miss from my action scenes these days is just being able to see where everyone is. It's like yeah. you know everything is so closely cut and cut so harshly that a uh, a lot of the time, we're just supposed to feel that action is happening. But I could feel it and see it. And uh, obviously, he had a brief history with these two. And they're like thieves. They want his swords anyway. There's enough there that's like character-based, but then it's also just him showing off how good he is as a swordsman, which is helpful for his journey. I mean, it's hard for me not to say that I really like uh, Zorro. He's <laughs> just that cool factor along with uh, the way he's, he's played by the actor. But... Some of the I found just a lot of fun is that he's like he's like nobody's man. He's his own team. He does whatever he wants. Yep. But he's just drawn to Luffy. He's like, mm -mm. and we get in uh, I think episode two when he's caged up and he can hear Luffy screaming. He's like, we need we need to get out of here so we can help him. Mm -hmm. And she's like, why do you care about him so much? And then he's like, like like he's he's almost like uh, conflicted with himself about why he does because he doesn't care about anything. But he's just like, nah, this guy he's just like he's just a good person. Like, I'm fully yeah. convinced he's a good, wholesome person, and I want to fucking help him. I want to protect him. I always it's, like as uh, well how, like, wherever they go, he just wants to find the nearest bar. <laughs> he's always trying too, to get yeah. drunk. I, I was really surprised how uh, the intro to Sanji hit me. I, and, and I thought, what an interesting character. Of course, totally anime. The, uh, the kung fu wielding, uh, uh, triple A, uh, you know, uh, 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 Michelin star. Yeah. chef he just wants to be the best <laughs> chef and, and and he's always in his jacket and tie that's totally yeah. anime but he's like the actor's so fucking cool like the he's way he's oh yeah himself, he's just so like, easy oh, to man, like the guy just radiates confidence and well, the, i love the um the uh daddy uh, the, the sort of father figure again yeah um, that was a surprise uh, and it's once again this this person that's got this huge history loads of experience loads of uh wisdom to impart and he Runs a fair but harsh sort of restaurant. He's got a ridiculous hat, the ridiculous mustache, but I don't give a shit. Everything's taken for what it is. It's obviously uh, adapted directly, I assume. And um, I can get drawn straight in. It's not distracting at all that everyone looks strange or that, you know, because it, it's, yeah. it's all just a part of the world. It's all being taken very seriously. You have that whole backstory and then every interaction they have, all leading up to the end where uh, Sanji leaves with the crew. Yeah. And that so was... it's quite emotional. No, it was fantastic, and the and the turnaround where Sanji, when he was young and stuck on that butte in the middle of the water, found out that he got all the food. That that, that was an amazing turn. Yeah. I I didn't expect it. Well, it's all just uh, again. It goes back to what I was saying about like once you start to learn more about these characters, like you understand, like well, okay, that's why they've gotten to the profession they're in. That's why they are on this quest right they've all got different motivations for doing it but they're all bound to bed together by this common purpose and they they gradually learn to work together and i don't know man it like Moller said it's so standard from a, a, a plot mechanics and storytelling point of view it's wrapped up in this fantastical world with big like larger than life characters but it's it's pretty standard storytelling but it's just nice to see and it's nice to see characters that they're not trying to constantly like deconstruct and subvert them. It's just like, yeah, we're, we, the, you've got the happy go lucky hero, uh, you know, who, who is out for adventure. You've got the, you know, the, the brooding um, swordsman. You've got the, the, um, you know, the uh, mysterious navigator who's got like 
different um, reasons for doing this. It's all just like interesting characters like thrown together into the mix. Uh, and they don't and, have to be horrible people to have a, this weird veneer of strength. And, and, uh, and in almost that. every single case, the characters create the problems that they themselves have to solve. It, it's yeah. they're not external. They this is the choice they've made. They go into the thing. It's a and that they've got to solve it. It's not sudden, suddenly something from outer space comes and they've got to defeat it. Yeah. Um, it's it's a quest. Yeah, you know, it's a quest that like they're they're choosing to do it, and yes, yeah, it's 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 again, it's just the spirit of adventure. Like that's it's Star guess, Trek. The, the whole point of yeah, and it's interesting as well, right? Because they they talk often about the the pirates versus the marines. It's like the forces of the the world government, you know, the forces of order um, and tyranny, really. Um, versus like the the freewheeling pirates who are just uh you know you could see them as being a force of evil like who maraud and, and pillage and stuff but then you find out like well each side actually has nuances and layers to them because there's pirates like right luffy says that they're they're not really out to destroy people or or steal things or whatever they just want adventure but they just don't want to be ruled over by this world government and you've also got the marines who actually there's people in in amongst that who just believe in protecting the innocent and right. upholding law and order and just ensuring fair treatment for everyone so like there's there's so many layers to both of these organizations where as in real life not everyone who takes part in a cause is good is all good or all bad there's a mixture of people and again i think there's that's a really nice sophisticated bit of uh, of storytelling for a relatively like simple premise i guess and 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 because kobe decided not to go with luffy and go with his dream his dream of being a marine suddenly the marines are no longer npcs yes to be mowed down they're 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 not stormtroopers to be shot to death well he's our window into them correct that's what i i i'm completely shocked on, on how this thing was all constructed now that being said he's done a thousand mangas <laughs> He's he's kind of figured it out. We're not going to be stuck into with the uh, uh, George R. R. Martin trap where he hasn't finished writing the book. This thing has been this is this so much material in the original that and, and he's already figured it out over time. Uh, so we, I think we're seeing we're seeing that now. That being said, uh, two shows, Wheel of Time and uh, and The Witcher. Uh, they had a rich source of material to work from and they choose to ignore it. Uh, so. Yeah. Well, that's what that's what happens when the the person who wrote the source material doesn't have creative control, and it just gets get, right. given over to a bunch of hacks who are out to go into business for themselves and tell their own stories. Um, but in order, well, I tell you what, actually, to shed more light on all of this, we've got <gasps> Mister Nerdrotic himself Woo! live from Paris. <laughs> Hello, Hello, how are you? How's, Bonjour. How's things, in, how's things in gay Paris, <laughs> Gary? Super I saw the gay. I saw the Eiffel Tower. I thought you were in Vegas. Uh, well, uh, I will be soon. But no, I was. I'm at the real Eiffel Tower, where uh, many people tried to sell us wine. Yes, like if you could just sell wine on the streets, and man, they really wanted oh, no, to sell me wine. Nightmare. I know. Well, my wife was fine with that, the lush, but uh, I yeah. personally can't. Uh, it, it, hello, everybody. Uh, from Marge, Hi, <laughs> I mean, so thank, you for, thank you for giving a little bit of time from your vacation, man, to to join us for this. Uh, I really good. appreciate it. It's all good. Yeah. Ten thirty here, so ten thirty nine. But uh, yeah, finally, we're almost on the same time scale. Or the <laughs> no, same it's time so zone. late. Ugh. <laughs> I like yeah, the that stream was good, sure, Gary. I was trying to join you for yesterday, Gary. I, I love how you were at a reasonable British time, which meant I was asleep. <laughs> I know. I'm like, you're asleep. What? <laughs> <laughs> that's why, that's why I always make it to the American shows. Uh, well, yeah. That's a lie. Everyone knows you don't sleep. You wait. Listen, yeah. I'm trying to keep up appearances, okay? If they believe it, yeah. then <laughs> keep doing that human thing. Like, what, <laughs> what else do they like? Uh, humans like to drink water, I've heard. So, yeah, water's great. I love water and food. <laughs> How do you do, fellow humans? Uh, 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 speaking of water, I've, I've been watching the old Carsons because they're now online and they had one. Uh, one segment with uh, Dean Martin and Dean Martin says, uh, 
hey, do you have anything to drink? And Carson says, here, I got this. He's, he brings up, he's, and Martin goes, what is this, water? I haven't seen this since I was 16. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> Ah, uh, the good old days. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we were just talking a little bit about One Piece and how we've, we've been really enjoying it. It's been a real surprise. Best show I've seen this year. Yeah, I agree. Like, not even close. Uh, I'm on uh, <laughs> that's like one <laughs> thing. Okay. I mean, I know Ahsoka is like the greatest thing ever because they brought back somehow Anakin returned again. Again. <laughs> again. <Somehow. laughs> And we will, uh, we will definitely talk about Ahsoka soon. Yeah. It is- One Piece is fantastic, man. I'm on my third viewing uh, all the way through, and I'll probably wow. watch the plane on the way home. I am freaking loving it. Uh, my, my grade is going up as time goes on. It's so interesting to compare the two shows, isn't it? Just uh, yeah. as a random choice, like because they happen to be on at the same time. Like one is like this crazy you know outlandish um, manga adaptation with like really old, larger than life characters and like this bizarre world that like doesn't even make a lick of sense uh and yet it's made with such joy and such um, excitement and it just really kindles that in the audience like you can tell that like they, they so much uh, passion went into it then compare that to Ahsoka, where everyone looks so fucking bored that they just want to die um and you know it's Wait just, a second it's- hold on hold on hold on yeah, thank you. Wait. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Let's do it. Oh. Wait, do we have to spin round? <laughs> Why must you remind me? Oh, that's <laughs> called character writing, okay? Just Muller. this boring, soulless, assembly line piece of corporate crap. And like, wow, what a difference it makes to just have a show where people care about shit. That is so nice. And that's what we get from One Piece. Like you say, Gary, you just enjoy it. You can't help but have fun with it. You can't help but like Luffy, right? This- oh, it's anti nihilism. That's, yep, that's what the show is. Yes. I, I was just talking about that, like how great a job the actor does and just how great the writing is for him as well. Like I say, there's something um, just uh, glorious about a character who just wants to go on an adventure. He wants to get out into the world and explore for the sheer joy of doing it. You obviously get more layers to him as you learn more about him, but like that's that's a great way to approach life. One could argue he might be the first character like a teacher would teach you about when it comes to storytelling. And mm-hmm. it's like, well, it's been a while since we've had one of those, so maybe that's why it feels so fresh. But yeah. he, if you follow anime, he, he is an archetype that goes right back to Speed Racer. It goes right back to The Seven Deadly Sins. It goes back to The Gate. It, I mean, uh, there's a just a complete line of people, indomitable heroes who are really confident who still get their ass kicked one punch man i mean uh uh that is really key to driving i think any story forward you want to see a, a a hero uh positive about their own abilities and uh, they get themselves in you know into the problems that they they find themselves because of their positivity they screw up because they're too confident yeah, uh, you know, and that's the, he he puts his friends in danger. Yes, because he's got this power that can, you know, that's why he's got such a great attitude now. Uh, and you saw what his attitude was when he was a kid, and the way they're mixing in the character work. I, I'm not kidding. This is the yeah. best character work I've seen in many years, many many years. You know where you are. You know who you like. You know what their motivation is in in an episode and a half. And there's more development. Yep in the first episode of this show than anything in Disney star Wars combined combined. Oh, like yeah, it's, yeah. it's a joke. Uh, and, uh, you know, watching it through, I'm still catching, uh, other things. And listen, I don't know the source material mm-hmm. other than I read a couple volumes of the manga. It's very much in the spirit of what I read. The storytelling in the manga is really good. I'm not the biggest fan of the art. No, but this no. is going to make it so much more palpable and it's going to get a percentage of people more in, it's going to get more people in the manga. Not that the American comic book industry needs to hear that right now, but uh, <laughs> it, it, you're, you're screwed. You you're know what? I, I, I disagree yeah, but... about um, Disney products not moving forward. We found out in the first episode of Andor that he's looking for his sister, and then she he ignored her for the rest of the series. Oh. <laughs> I didn't finish the series, so I, d- I didn't care enough to know. Um, she never never came back first episode i gotta find my my sister that's it andor is the one thing we can <laughs> leave alone in disney's lineup okay it's the one thing that actually has something worthwhile in it yes it's want. it's true but even then anyway so i i jest yeah you're you're um, right you're right gary it is just a joyous experience 
It, yeah, this is why I do this, right? To to find gems like this and then do a half an hour review on it, which I fully plan to do when I get back. I don't care how late it is. I don't care who watches it. I don't care. I, I just want to do this. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, this is it, probably not, but Hollywood learns from this. You know, it, it, it was just, it's a real, you know, Mahler and I talked about it on Real BBC. It's simple. It's a simple story. It doesn't subvert expectations. It's a hero's journey. Uh, but it also has this multi-layered world that's fun and it's wacky. It's kooky, but somehow, I mean, like people are talking to each other on freaking snails. Yeah, you know? yeah. that's bizarre. <laughs> that, that's a good bizarre. It's very Terry Gilliam, right? Yes. Uh, I, this this reminds me of Time Bandits a lot, and the mm-hmm. fisheye lens reminds me how he shoots. And uh, my wife was watching it today. The first words out of her mouth was, "It was, it's beautiful." Wow, and it, and it is. It's a beautiful show. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and I think there's a lot to be said for just having these these characters, these archetypes who just embrace what they are, and like, there's not this shitty, cynical attempt to deconstruct everyone, um, and and you know try to say like, oh, all of this stuff doesn't mean anything. This crappy nihilistic view that you get from Hollywood, and I, as I mentioned in my review when I talked about it, like a lot of this I think comes down to the fact that the original um, author of the manga. He um he has the creative control over this show when they when he gave the rights to Netflix he's like yeah I can still overrule you and he did multiple times like he forced them to reshoot and rewrite a whole bunch of scenes because he wasn't happy with them because you know what they would have turned this into if you didn't have a guy like him saying no to them this would have been Cowboy Bebop times ten yeah and and he's he's got the power because it's the best selling manga correct me if I'm wrong chat best selling manga of all time yes. Yes, uh, it, it sold more volumes than Batman. Yeah, uh, and Batman's been out for eighty years, so it's it's crushing anything American right now. Um, and I see why. I see why people like it now. So many people yeah. are trying to get me into this, and uh, I had a, a great person send me a bunch of stuff, and I'm glad. I'm glad he did because now I'm going to burn through all of it. <laughs> the, the manga the manga the anime is very different it's it's more naruto in that uh naruto that a lot of nothing happens for a good chunks of time there's things that are a lot of time wasting that 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 isn't a tradition of of a certain kind yeah. of manga well with so, that many volumes right? yeah yeah so i i'm not a huge fan i like the characterizations and and, and you know the and and i think the thing that oda did and I have to, I give him a huge amount of credit, and this also probably goes to the uh, the producers too. Is that the show isn't like the anime? That the anime is still wacky, Tex Avery faces, eyes bugging out, and stuff like that. Obviously, you can't do that with people, and they've made it more adult. They 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 have. He's transformed it. He took the energy and the spirit, or the the production company and Oda managed to capture the spirit of it without slavishly trying to copy it yes and that's good because uh uh anime could be a little wacky again i'll probably like the manga more and that's that's probably what i'll i'll stick with yeah than the anime you also need to watch arcane apparently Yes, I do. I am going to watch Arcane. Matt, right? or, 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 I'm sure I gave, I gave you a hard time about this in London, I think. <laughs> sure to they you they smell there. conflict. No, nah, don't bother with Arcane. Fabulous animation, shitty story. Wow. Ooh. Bother oh, with Arcane. Sure. It's the greatest TV show that's come out in the past five years. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got I got my ass handed. Guys, we're in echo chamber. I keep I, telling we're in echo chamber. I believe, Gary, that you would very much enjoy Arcane. I'd probably like it. Um, yeah, I, I, you didn't. yeah. Just put your taste in a bag <laughs> <laughs> and seal it. That's a that's a that's, that's what that's I do a when conversation I conversation for a whole other stream. We would need a lot. So what I do when I go to the UK to eat food. <laughs> 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 it's not so bad. It's better. Oh, oh, I French think food. as well. Oh, so good. Oh, mm. Mm. French 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 yum. Oh, the yeah. baguette, the baguette avec yes. le... lots of baguettes around here. Yeah, baguette. And uh, yeah. <laughs> But, uh, dude, I, I'm so happy. Like, this was such a surprise, right? Uh, you know, I saw Yellow Flash and Jeremy talking about it, and I'm like, well, you know, I'm on a long flight. I've got extra time. Let's watch it. And just got hooked. And then, uh, you know, we watched it as a group. Uh, and, you know, we started out with, the, especially with Kobe, we're all, hmm, I don't know about this. 
Uh, but it was me, Mark the Cyborg, X-Ray Girl, Quarter Black Garrett, Adam Krigler, Shad, all watching it together and just getting hooked. And me and Shad burned through almost uh, the entire series. Uh, we got to up the end. I'm, sh- I'm sure he's watched the end by now. But uh, I, I, I'm, I'm glad we're seeing like the word of mouth uh, on this. Yeah. Catch- and, and I'm also glad we're not seeing any actors like ruining the show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hmm. You know, it's it's like great. This is. I, I don't know if you've watched any of the marketing for it, but the the actors were they did games, they were put together. They're extremely charming together. That's what and, you want to see. It's like I, I just want to hear about your experiences making the show and like the fun you yep. had and stuff. I don't care if you're a fucking activist and you go to all kinds of marches and protests and all that crap. Like nobody cares about that. What we care about is just like what you've done in relation to this show. That's now, what now, you used to get. So, so I'm just wondering whether there's a relationship with the fact that uh, the shows that the activists are promoting in an activist way end up being shitty. Were they shitty to begin with? And that was maybe their expression of their lack of real commitment to the show. Like it, it, psychologically, maybe, you know, they knew the show was shitty and that's the way that they behave. Oh. But when you're on a show that you really love, you are predisposed to create more love well we saw that with with house of the dragon because we did hear hey some of us were like why are the valerians black but uh they answered the question like really intelligently in the story Mm -hmm. and the guy got mad at the fandom and then he backed off yes (laughs) he did he backed off and you know oh wait a minute you know we just wait to wait for the story to play out and then we go oh oh it works totally works you know that's that's been somebody banging on our wall (laughs) <laughs> it's okay. the french they're they're it's fucking Paris, in the you know? next room there's well, yeah, really an yeah. Norman bates or anything is there dude yeah. i know i'm in a nice hotel in france but it's like a, okay it's five by five so i had my prison cell was bigger than this but um <laughs> yeah you can leave that hotel then whenever you want i can leave it whenever <laughs> i want it's my great God. uh no no so to to answer your question paul like some stuff is filled with um the message already but a lot of the times it's cope it's we know we have a giant turd and we need to get somebody to watch Mm. it let's make it a movement and quite frankly Mm. it worked with uh black panther and to a a certain extent captain marvel you know uh, disney convinced people you're fighting racism if you watch black panther that's some of the best marketing i have ever seen uh so that really got the ball rolling to this uh for this fan baiting basically movement marketing that hasn't worked since like it's buried shows since instead of letting the shows speak for themselves unfortunately most of the shows are garbage that's an interesting point as well like when you when you have activists as well who become the writers on the show which inevitably happens you get in things like the witcher where it's just like they are entirely in business for themselves it's about pushing their worldview and putting their characters or their spin on the source material and you think, wow, if only, uh, is it Andrei Sapkowski who yes. wrote the original Witcher books? If he'd had creative control over the Witcher TV show in the same way that the author of One Piece had done, what might we have gotten? But Oof. he's like the world, he's literally the world's worst fucking businessman that's ever existed. Uh-huh. Like he signed away the video game rights for like 50 bucks or something. <laughs> Just. Yeah, barely. He, he got he got he got paid back for that though. Red Red Code get, came back and and I thought I thought he rejected it though. Didn't they offer him like a, a pretty like and, and then but they came back later and, like, and they came back later and said, "Hey, dude, take the cash." Okay, but that's just purely on their generosity. Yes. it wasn't like yeah. he'd negotiate a shrewd nope. contract or anything. No, he's not like and, Oda at, no. at all. And same deal with the TV show. Like, I'm pretty sure he's not happy with what they've done with his characters. Well, and well, the like third season, it's it's filled with none of his characters. <laughs> the third season, yeah, like ninety uh, percent like of the characters don't well, exist in his books. <laughs> what's What's important is we hear Yennefer's story finally. That's true. It's, Thank God. You know, <laughs> and, and you're and right. you got to take you got to take Geralt out, so he's lying on a cot for three shows. Well, yeah, I mean, who wants a Witcher <laughs> show that's got no. the Witcher in it? Like, I certainly don't. You know, don't be ridiculous. genius. <laughs> uh, but I, 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 one of the things I wanted to mention about uh, One Piece is, uh, you know, as a former network executive, don't underestimate how much the network probably 
inserted themselves even in Cowboy Bebop and, and how much they screwed that up. So don't 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 blame all put all the blame on the production company. Uh, I will guarantee you that when they were doing uh, Cowboy Bebop, the Netflix was demanding a name actor for the lead character for Spike. I guarantee you that. So they got John Cho, who was absolutely wrong for the role. Then he got injured. He was too old, too short, didn't have that energy that Spike needed. They needed a no-name person, probably I would have preferred a, a Japanese person and uh, to, to stay true to the, to the uh, original, but make him tall, be able to kick ass. Uh, the guy had to be Jet Li quality. And I think the show probably could have worked. Uh, and, and I think in uh, One Piece, they went, no, nope, we don't care about hiring a name main actor. Luffy can be, the, get the best Luffy. I and think they did. And they did. Well, I don't know if and, he was the best, but like they got a really fucking good guy in for him. Yeah. So, yeah. but he's a no name. And I, and I think maybe that was both the production company and Netflix easing off. I, I'm absolutely certain that was think, one of the lessons they learned in Netflix. In, I was going to say, um, yeah, do you think this was a lessons learned kind of situation? Because yes. I know like Oda had creative control anyway, so that definitely helped. But do you think they also just thought, we can't do Cowboy Bebop over again? Clearly right. us trying to imprint our fucking Californian mindset yep. onto a Japanese anime is just not compatible. And and I guarantee you that's why John Cho was in, in Cowboy Bebop, because that was a demand from the network saying put in a name person. Yeah. I think that the, that little video that Daniela Pineda <laughs> made just did <laughs> so much damage to that. I mean, thank show. you. But... <laughs> oh man. She was she was legit like the Rachel Zegler of, of her day. Yeah, from a couple of years ago, like just absolutely torpedoed her own project before it even got off the ground. That was brilliant. And the costumer was. Uh, did you see the video from the costumer for the show? No. Who went? Oh wait, uh, I think it did. Yeah. Yeah, she said, "Well, you can't have costumes that look like um, Faye from the thing, so we've made her more modern and stuck her in dark leathers and <laughs> that yeah. took all her I mean, femininity away from her." And <laughs> we made her as frumpy as possible. That's we right. Ro we rose look, decoed her. And then look yes. at Nami. You know, Nami in one piece, wearing you know, short skirts, very, very yeah. short nice skirts, tight, tight tops. Yeah, it works. You know, no, the, <laughs> no complaint. I, I don't know how to say this. Like, <laughs> it just the works. Actress, not necessarily the most beautiful you could find, but like, you know, she's got charisma about her and she's, she's not unattractive and they know how to make the most of her. So, why not? Like you say, no complaints there. Yeah, I liked her. I thought she was good. Yeah, she was. I liked she, and, her. And as the important well. thing is as well, like they actually wrote her as a likable character. Yeah. As well. They they weren't just like, okay, the way to make her strong is just have her be a complete bitch to everyone and be amazing at everything. Because that, that definitely works, doesn't it? Like, no, she's, she she loses arguments sometimes. She can, you know, she doesn't always make the right call. She's got flaws, but you absolutely like her because she's because of those things. So conflicting loyalties, right? Like to a initial village versus, versus the the fish lads and stuff. Ar Arlong, she was really yeah. a working with Arlong. Speaking of performances, no one has brought up uh, McKinley's Arlong. Holy Jesus! How do you She's act under it. all that latex? I don't know, but it's and it should be silly. It should be downright stupid, and it wasn't. And no, uh, you're right. Layers. And, uh, you know, even at the end, well, well, I don't want to spoil too much, uh, but they're basically, you know, fishmen are superior, uh, because they've been kept down. And even, you know, Luffy says something to the effect of, well, it doesn't matter. I mean, you're, you're out killing people. So you're basically, and I'm paraphrasing, you're the bad guys, you know, doesn't matter like how much you think you've suffered, what your, your actions, uh, don't, don't mean shit after that now, uh, cause you're out there killing innocent people. So whatever righteous cause you had is gone. Uh, and uh, I thought that was really cool. There's a lot of like based stuff in this. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. Incredibly based stuff in this. Again, that that Japanese influence, like, because yep. uh, as I said in my video, like when you try to impose like modern Californian uh, Hollywood values <sighs> on Japanese properties, that shit is not going to fly for them at all. They, they will not accept that garbage. And so... Yep, they were smart enough, I guess, to back off with this one and just let it be what it is. 
know, and unlike Marvel, successful. and unlike Marvel, they didn't kill off the bad guys. <laughs> no, yep. no, and, God and, and, and and he's going to be back. Like, Arlong's going to be back. He just got buried under a whole bunch of rock. Oh, I yeah. yeah. feel like all the bad guys come back. We got they do because uh, yeah, like, people just they don't get killed as such. They just get punched off into the distance. And yes, like, oh, they'll like come Team back Rocket. Later. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we'll be back next time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's fine like again it ties into the anime source material where like rather than just have the bad guy get killed after one episode okay let's bring them back but let's explore a bit more about how they became yeah, genuinely what do they want? marvel could never seem to figure out no. um we talked about it way back when black widow came out but we were like why wasn't taskmaster here since phase one working as a merc for all these different bad guys imagine he was like a you know a task completer for um obadiah stain <laughs> And you know we see him briefly, but then we don't see him at all. And then he's he's doing a job for this person, doing a job for this person, and he, he always does the shit of like when the Avengers mean, turn up, when the bad guys are losing, he fucks off. He's like, oh, I'm out of here. You mean she more? Uh, yeah. yeah. You mean the stuff they did in the comics, Mahler? Oh wow! Because what? then when you do the thing of him turning up, people are like, ah, oh, it's the person I know. It's really straightforward. <laughs> like. It's whatever you know, One Piece. Stuff. It just does all these simple tricks for storytelling that everyone knows about, but nobody wants to do anymore. Keyword being subversive, right? And and again, I don't want to demonize the word, but when you're like, I don't want to tell the story of kid who wants to be on adventures, going on adventures. That's boring. I want to do kid who wants to die. <laughs> like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, you know, they take on these stories that are much more difficult to tell because you need to understand what the original ones like are, how they work before you can subvert. And they can't even pull off the original. Like, can you make me a character who just wants to go on an adventure and make me like them? That should be the test. Before you do that, don't do anything else. Yeah. <laughs> I think you should know have to know how to write before you write in Hollywood. But that doesn't yeah. seem to be uh, one, one of the reasons you get your job I, anymore. I, I have a new theory. And I, I just wrote a video on it. And because the Frantics and myself attended many uh, fan cons and, and comic cons and things like that. Uh, uh, and we uh, met many fans over the years. Uh, I realized what what's happened. I'd like to pitch this to you guys. T tell me which, whether you think I'm full of shit or not. Is that um, we'd always get fans uh, and a wide range. Wonderful. Uh, blue haired, fat lesbians, trans, like the whole range of everybody who just loves comics, loves comedy, loves Dr. Demento, loves just the world that we also love. So many people would come up to us, good intentioned, would tell us an idea that we should do, and that it was all shit. And we would uh, smile and thank them and be nice and everything else. What's happened is the comic book industry, especially, has hired those people. So the idea that they're not fans is a incorrect premise. That's a premise other people have been saying. No. Now, I'm not talking about the Witcher and, and Wheel of Time people. They're assholes. But I'm talking about so many people actually are fans, but they have no talent at all. And and I, I came to that conclusion that that's got to be it. The people who gave us the crappy ideas that we would just nod our heads and hope that they went away as quickly as possible, they've now got the jobs. I think it's oh. probably a complex picture where you've got some people exactly like you say, where... They, they genuinely love the property. Um, they just don't have any skill to tell stories, but they, they tick the right boxes and so they get they get hired. I think there are other people who genuinely either hate the property, but they just happen to get hired for this thing because, again, they fit the right categories and they just, their only solution is, well, I'm just going to tell the story I want to tell. And, you know, this is just the basic framework I'm going to use as my jumping off point, but really it's just about me. Uh, and those those are the two kind of levels of writers that you quite often deal with, and you can tell, you you can tell when they start talking, they start doing interviews, and they start saying like, "Well, I wanted to put my spin on it. I wanted to adapt <laughs> it for modern audiences, or I wanted to focus on this character because it was something that inspired me. It's all about me, what I want." Self insert. Uh, and so you can tell, yeah, you can tell when it's a self insert. You can tell when they don't particularly care for the source material. Uh, it's all just about like, what story can I tell that I care about. Yeah. yeah, what happened in, in the comic book industry in particular, uh, Paul, 
was yes, those people did take over, but they did make comics. They didn't like superhero comics though. And they were, uh, if you're familiar with the alternative press expo, mm-hmm. which was like the indie, uh, con for that was put on by the san diego comic con so it was everybody who did uh, autobiographical cl- comics like blankets or some you know unicycle I, I riding lesbian with one leg and her you know lesbian <laughs> chronicles they took over the comic book industry because a they were cheap they were cheap talent and they were fans of comics but it was more like zines and you know that underground stuff and they brought right. it to the mainstream and they were just it was oh it was it, it was a uh, square peg round hole totally wrong for the industry plus they were super um they were all from liberal arts college colleges so these specific here in america not sure if you have them in the uk or not we have a shit ton of uh like the san francisco art academy i think that's the name they used to be the biggest landowner in san francisco they owned the most land in san francisco they have buses everywhere and all these uh uh you know middle class wine box moms were sending their kids to to san francisco art institute to be and listen it's it's pumped out a couple of people but it, it it was just a conveyor belt of shit that came out of there that ended up going down in the hollywood and it, we need to get rid of all of that. I, I personally, not everybody can do art. And I think art should be kind of artist apprentice kind of thing. You find an actual master to pass on. But no, you have these teachers there and they're all failures. They were all fucking failures. So they're passing on their failure and their politics. And it's permeated our culture. And it's been going on in San Francisco for years. But it became an industry. And they would just shovel those people down to L.A. I saw it. I mean, they, they shopped at my store. Some of them were nice people. But as you said, Paul, they just didn't have the talent. Yep. They, I didn't have the talent. I, I sold comic books. I couldn't make one. I couldn't write one. I knew that. I was fine with that. I still loved it. Uh, and, yeah, the, the, this is a specialized industry. Hollywood is a specialized industry. The comic industry is a specialized industry. Not that many people can do what Paul can do, what Will can do. You know, it's it's – it's a rare talent. That's why it's a rare talent. It's not like it's not like being a Jedi in Star Wars now. Where anybody can do it. You I'm know, not even sure, I can do what I can do. <laughs> That's about- I, 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 apparent, apparently, we all have the Force, though. Ooh, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. You I was going to talk about that in a moment. Actually, I was going to move on to Ahsoka, but just before I do, I wanted to do this one from Cassius Victus uh, for $50. Whoa, fifty dollars. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, it says, I've been a big uh, fan of One Piece for almost 20 years, and it's so refreshing to hear people discuss it like this. Comparing it to other very sort of various other stories is an avenue I've yet to hear about when discussing the series, and I love it. Excellent. No, All thank right. you, man. I'm glad you've enjoyed the discussion so far. Like I say, it's just nice for us to be able to do something like this and talk about a series or a movie that we can all really appreciate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm absolutely certain it's Netflix that learned the lesson. Because network, uh, inter- studio interference is a sport in Hollywood that maybe you guys just don't grasp how bad it is. Yeah. And this show totally took the risk so others can do it now of like, oh, we can't they, adapt that properly. They, they, Look at that. It looks ridiculous. No one's going to like that. And it's like, nope, you, you can know, do it. You know what? I know the egos in Hollywood. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Be their mistake. Well, They're slow, leaving money on the slow. table. <laughs> They're, yeah, they're, I mean, well, I, I, I slowed um, the tip um, the, the scale, I think. So. It's going to take a longer than you hope. There's another one here from Garrett Hayden for four, uh, for basically for fifty dollars. He said, "I had my reservations, yet I couldn't help but be caught up in the tide of positivity." And Mauler's words finally tipped me <laughs> over the edge to go and see One Piece. Oh yeah, you didn't fucking care what I had to say, <laughs> fucking pleb drinker over here. Uh, I... no. Now I want to see and support the original and buy all of the manga. Thanks, you massives. Yeah, it's not what I said. Watch the pilot. It's really fun. If you don't like it, then I guess that's that. But if you do, you'll have a whole season of uh, entertainment ahead of you. It was all of in Mabel that convinced me to watch it. Um, But hey, that was one piece. But like, well, you know, the the universe has a way of balancing itself (laughs) out. And so it was a really enjoyable one piece. We had Ahsoka episode five, and I can tell you guys are excited to talk about it. <laughs> it's 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 a funny spell that this show is weaving on people, as far as I can see on Twitter. Um, they pull out the member berries and they squeeze them without mercy uh, until they get a little bit of juice out, and people just absolutely lap it up. And that's what we've been getting in this episode. Remember Holy Anakin? Shit, yes. Remember the Clone Wars? 
Remember how you used to like that stuff? Well, we've got it here. We've brought back Hayden Christensen. Again. He's here to teach Ahsoka a lesson. What is he teaching her? Don't know. It doesn't matter. It's more important that you get to see another lightsaber duel between them. Just remember that. We got a blinky Anakin Darth Vader gif. Wow. Yay. Did you see, though, his red his lightsaber was blue and then it was red. It was and blue his, before, his not eyes, red. His eyes did the red thing and then they went like yes. normal again when he was bloodshot. And yeah. and people uh, on Twitter who are fans of the show uh, uh, were crying at the, yes. the the giphy thing, right? They were they said, "Oh my god, I was in tears." Uh, okay, there there's a a video out there by the Grizzy. So he does reaction. He, what he does, he cuts the reactors together, puts in his own little pithy comments. It's pretty funny. His latest one, Chef's Kiss. It's oh, so boy. good. So, <laughs> oh, the Grizzy, go the check Grizzy. it out. Yeah, it's it's Dude, hilarious. The um, split between sycophantic Star Wars fans and like film Twitter, where you have them being like, "This is the greatest shot in cinematic history." That all the film nerds are like, "This is shit." What do you mean? <laughs> like, this the, is, the yeah, people who got like the context who are like, "Why is this impressive?" Like, it's smoke, you idiots. That's the only thing that's different about this. There's a guy <laughs> walking is... with smoke. This is the child's view. Like every time a kid sees a new movie, like they see freaking Endgame for the last time or whatever, and like, or, sorry for the first time, and they're like, "Oh my god, this is the best film ever!" And then they watch Jurassic World Dominion. And they're like, "Oh my god, this is the best film ever!" It's like because you don't know anything, you don't have any point of comparison. That's that's the the level we're at now. And I think <laughs> I, we were discussing this earlier. Star Wars fans have been conditioned to accept the sludge. The sludge is just like their baseline for what Star Wars is now. And when you get something that's just a slight level above that, it's slightly more interesting or it's got something that they vaguely remember or recognize, they're like just clapping like the mindless seals. You know, oh my God, this is amazing. This has saved Star Wars. Dave Filoni is a genius. No, it hasn't. And no, he isn't. <laughs> and people won't like this in a couple of months, weeks, maybe. It depends they on won't how even remember it. That's the thing. They won't remember it. They won't like or dislike it. They'd be like, what was well, Ahsoka? I don't know. The precedent for that is the fact that a lot of people think this is the return of Hayden Christensen as Anakin. It's like, oh, gu guys, he was he was already back in Kenobi. None of you liked oh, yeah, it, though. Don't you remember? It's like, no, this you might... don't fucking remember because you don't even think about this sludge that's getting shoved down your throat. You just consume it and then move on to the next thing. This might be breaking news for some Star Wars fans, but Anakin Skywalker's story ended. Yep. Uh, it ended a, yeah. quite some time ago, all right, uh, in Return of the Jedi, and he can't come back. Well, what if we have a will is between this, worlds is, that isn't time travel but converges right. all of time? Is, is this what Star Wars is now? Has it become pickers of bones, meddlers in other men's affairs? <laughs> Defiler of corpses. That's what they are. They are uh, it's code blue, okay? It, 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 code it blue. reminds well, yeah, me. Yeah, as, as more. Oh, sorry, on you go. No, no, it's okay. No, I was just um, going to say, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, as as Mauler was alluding to there, can someone clue me in? What the fuck even was Anakin in this? Is he a force ghost? Is he a memory? Is he an imaginary friend? Is he a fragment of like Anakin's consciousness trapped in the world between worlds? Who fucking knows? Dave Filoni probably doesn't know or care. It's just a thing. It's just another thing that you remember. Just bring Hayden Christensen in again because we remember him. I think Ahsoka hit her head on a rock on the way into the water. Yes. Can, and like, so does her went... species does her species need oxygen, by the way? Because she was underwater That's for not... like 12 hours. That's not. Oh, dude, I have seen such cope about this. People are like, uh, idiot, she was teleported into the world between worlds and then teleported back into the water just right, right before they found Ow. her. I'm going to do it again, more. <laughs> <laughs> I, I legit when they give answers like that i'm like do you know how many questions you've just created by answering the one question <laughs> like, do you have any clue fucking teleported into the world between she worlds. fell into a Fuck space whale's vagina you know like how in the hell did that happen that it's so dumb it is there so were, dumb and it was, it was mainly, seals it, it what i assume it was was all in her head yeah, like it, while she was unconscious, it was on her That's head, which makes it completely meaningless to the story. Correct. She just had to talk herself into, "Oh, I'm still awesome, and I need to live." That's it. That's it. 
That's what, what I thought. Her, yeah, what was his lesson that he wanted to teach her? Okay. It's like, do you want to live or die? Uh, we got a list. Can I, can I live? Gotta... All right, okay, you, you passed. No, no, no. The, the so lesson cool. was, the lesson was don't buy retail. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so <laughs> the lesson is the thing we do pretty much every day. Try not to die. <laughs> try to live <laughs> and try not to die. I, Thanks. That's so, so deep, Dave Filoni, you savior. I, for some reason, am personally invested in finding out what the fuck the point of this episode was, and so I've looked at almost, like, every interpretation. I have a list of different expl explanations from people who actually like it, right? I so number one exist. was Ahsoka is not feel Like, she's she's concerned as being Vader's disciple that she's on the same path and that she'll eventually become this horrible monster and that maybe she shouldn't continue because of that. That's one interpretation, and that by the end she decides, no, I'm going to fight and I'm going to be a good guy. Another is she feels responsible for all of the deaths that came under Vader because she wasn't there when he, uh, Anakin fell and therefore uh, you know, feels like unfulfilled or, or worthless and weak as a person and that this whole experience was to get her back on top. Another one is that she as a leader feels that whenever she like organizes anything, people die, people get in trouble. The clones, obviously, Sabine, fucking what her name, Hera, whoever, people get in trouble whenever she leads, and people die due to her orders, and she mm. just can't do it anymore, and Anakin's like, no, you gotta fight. And then another interpretation is that she's feeling suicidal because of the fact that whenever she's done fighting throughout her whole life, like, it just leads to death. Death, destruction, as Balin put it, if you remember, he was like, your path is one of death and destruction, or whatever. And so she's like, why not put a stop to it? Why not put a stop to the line that started with, you know, Anakin to Obi-Wan to Qui-Gon ends with her. Why teach Sabine to start killing people and extend this horrible but a, but a killing? I when I looked through all these, I was like, where the fuck are your references for all of this? Yeah. The whole episode these... is like it has like four lines from Anakin that amount to you gonna die now? You gonna die? All, all you gonna die now? <laughs> you gonna die, bro. Yeah, all of these like <laughs> suggestions that you come up with there, all these explanations would make for perfectly good character arcs for her throughout the season. I, but it would all hinge on her not being a fucking plank of wood with no emotions. These are things That's... they could have probably hinted more in and characterized more in the previous episodes. Seven seasons of Clone Wars and four seasons of Rebels that they like they kind of allude to but don't say specifically. Why uh, would this be I prompted think if you'd now? Have her be, if you'd have um, her be racked with guilt and yeah. um, like doubting herself throughout this whole season, maybe even be aggressive, uh, angry about her failures, that could have made the basis of a really good character arc. Yes. Her coming to terms with her failures, the shitty things, the horrible things she had to do during the Clone Wars, all of that. Great stuff. That's a good basis for a character. But you've got nothing. There's nothing to work with here. But you, 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 as a writer, you also have to merge it with the plot. So a character either advances character, advances plot, and pr preferably all both. Mm -hmm. And and th that kind of stuff is just endless. I mean, if you're going to try to squeeze in some kind of backstory character advancement, then you do it as short as they did in One Piece. You don't well, make it this weird, extended nonsense that it. is meaningless, uh, uh, meaningless to the plot. And, and the thing is, no one is motivated to do anything. The the contestants on the Great British Bake Off have more motivation than any of the characters in this show. You could fix this instantly, really easily, by having Ray Stevenson know exactly what she did during the Clone Wars and play on it. Yeah. Like, you, you're a fucking war criminal. You've led thousands of men to their deaths. You should you're you don't uh, represent what the Jedi right. are supposed to be. You're a failure. He yeah, don't tell me. Undermine. What, yeah, he what, could he could know who she is and undermine her confidence and absolutely also, destroy what, her. What did Darth Vader happened. do? Darth Vader got in your head that when he was fighting Luke, he got in his head, and you Ray Stevenson completely could do the same thing. Yep. But no, yep. well, I have an explanation. Um, somehow her her guilt returned. <laughs> um. <laughs> But she doing was, that at she, the same time as echoing the uh, the clone situation, have her command Sabine after she believes like she's fully capable of taking on the uh, Shin lady, and then have Sabine get an arm chopped off. Well, uh, Ahsoka and, should know, never have stopped taking my doll. Well, that's what I have to say <laughs> the thing is, like we we can verify more. No women were harmed in the making of this TV show. That's thank God. <laughs> you, you see what I mean? Though? Like, like she could then be defeated by him after sending someone into their own death, as far as she's aware. And she's, you know, has this low moment of being like, all I ever do is get people killed. 
like I'm useless. But the thing is, I don't even believe she could have that arc right now when she basically knows she's the only person who can stop the rise of Thrawn. He's on his way. How could you have this moment of like, oh man, I don't know if I should fight. It's like, what, what could possibly be bringing you down right now? You need to go tell Luke. You need to go tell the Republic. For some reason, right. you've been aloof and cardboard about it for the whole season up till no, now. You have to, I, you have to I, tell I, I Leia, genuinely... not Luke. Luke How, is out. I, I, I tell Leia. Leia. On by a literal who. She has no idea who Balin is. Neither do we. And yet, he, loved... he's saying that to her. has made her go nuts. I loved her non-reaction when she like was transported to the world between worlds and Anakin shows up and she's just like, hey, what's up? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What's going on? Like, you know, do you, don't you have questions? Like, where the fuck am I? What's going on? Like, who are hey, you? Are you a force ghost? Are you really Anakin? Am I imagining this? Shouldn't... Am I dead? Like, right. anything? <laughs> like... Shouldn't Anakin be telling her about Exegol? Maybe. Uh, Shouldn't he be like, I... by the way, the Emperor's not dead. He's not dead. <laughs> By the way, Pal Palpatine, Palpatine did, did nothing wrong at this point. Palpatine did nothing wrong. I am Team Empire now. Uh, they they were they're right all along. They didn't get six planets destroyed later. Uh, we should have just kept the Empire around. I think, yeah, the, the the New Republic deserved to lose, considering how yeah, shitty they are in every aspect. Terrible. Yep. We we talked Horrible. about this earlier, where it's like the refused to allow Hera permission to take even a squadron of X-Wings to go and investigate a potentially galaxy-ending threat, like this, <coughs> um, the return of Thrawn. Uh, and yet, so when they find dumb. out that when they find out that she took a few X-Wings away with her, they send an entire battle fleet of yep. starships to go and apprehend her. Oh, we're, oh, we're oh, allocation and, of and resources we, on this one, guys. And, and, it's no sense. And the woman that popped up in the uh, the little three D thingy, I <laughs> well, uh, uh, can't remember her oh, name. Mothra. Ma Ra yes, uh, uh, Mothra from uh, Godzilla. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I'd rather uh, she Mothra goes and and what is your Mothra. and what is your proof of of this? And she goes, I don't have any. Yes, you do. You, so can so you got tons of it. Soka was right there. You could just yeah, ask her. Yeah, two of your ships have been destroyed. Yeah. <laughs> do, do yeah. they have like dash cameras oh, or anything? Oh, and the robot, the, guy. Ship. the robot yeah. guy recorded the entire transporter circle-y thing. Yeah. yeah. Right? I mean. And also, like, why would I lie? It's like I'm a general in the, the fucking she has no clout, it's apparently. Like, okay, I'm saying I've, t I've seen this gigantic, like, space fucking vagina that can Correct. transport you into another galaxy. It looks like it's going to be really dangerous. There's a bunch of people who are talking about bringing back Thrawn. I think I've proven my loyalty. I wouldn't be lying about something like this. Can you just, like, send some back up to my location and help me out on this one? I'd really appreciate it. Like, that that doesn't seem like the sort of thing that you would need to prove if you were a person in her position to get a little bit of help from the, the Republic. Yeah. It's surprising isn't uh, Ahsoka and Anakin, by the way. A lot of people might feel like the episode was half and half, but if you chop it down, you get like, I think, 10 minutes of them at maximum, and most of it is shots where they're walking and running and shooting and lightsabers and smoke and flashes of stuff. And I think I'm being very generous when I say 10 minutes. So much of this fucking episode was like landscape shots and then Hera slowly walking, a kid slowly walking. That's right. Take take your kid to war day. I'm, I'm just going to say, yeah. Well, yeah, that fucking... What the fuck? Like, Hera comes out of the ghost. That's the, that's the name of her ship, isn't it? It's like the ghost. So yes. She brought her son to War Day, and like she gets, she comes down the ramp, and she points her gun around for two seconds, and she's like, "Meh, seems like the area is secure here." Jason, yeah. come out. I'm sure it's safe. It'll be fine. <laughs> and now he comes. Like, what the fuck is this? Why did you bring him here? What? Why did? What's your justification for any of this? It's like, oh, because she he's a baby sensitive. <laughs> so he can sense the the fucking like Ahsoka's dead body floating around in the water that apparently is still alive after like twelve hours of being submerged, and they can go and like fish her out. That's literally it. That's the best that Dave Filoni, the savior of Star Wars, can come up with. And and what Fuck was off. it? Fuck there there was show. a little bit of uh, Sabine smegma all over the uh, you know the the round. Uh... Um, Tetrisy thing, the map thingy. I mean, and, if, and, and if Ahsoka... can produce smegma, I'm, I'm impressed. Well, I, I'm, I'm <laughs> listen. I'm I'm giving. You know, I'm going out there and saying we're living in a trans world. There, you know, we're allowed to. They say can that. be. They can be anything they want. It can be anything they want. And uh, and she was able to. Ahsoka, I think, was able to pick up on 
on you know this is what she was thinking and this is what she heard from it's what's so, his name it's so convenient when the force convenient do yes. li literally anything it can allow you to replay past events mm-hmm that's and and this pretty is cool. pretty this handy. is the point I was trying to make with I, I I see this now so often, especially your other favorite show, Strange New Worlds and Star Trek, is that the writers just uh, uh, they come up with a convenient answer at that very moment, yeah. not based on any kind of logic at all. This is what we need to move this thing forward. Yes, I have the doctor in front of a very complicated uh, 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 communication device. Of course he knows how to use it. Of course. He's just a doctor. Why would he know the communication device on this uh, ancient vessel? It's like the writers just write what they need at the moment that they need it. It drives see, me nuts. In season two of Star Trek Discovery, Saru, the, uh, Saru? Uh, the Kelpian guy, I'm trying yeah, the to tall, the tall guy. Yeah, uh, is trapped. So he punches a hole in the floor and makes a communication device out of what he finds in there. There you go. <laughs> Works for me. Like <laughs> With no explanation, dude. <laughs> dude uh, and it's just gotten worse. That was years ago and it's just gotten worse. Um, yeah. It's star Wars, uh, Disney star Wars fans. I can't say star Wars fans. Disney star Wars fans are their own worst enemy. I mean, you like, like yeah. what you like, whatever. I don't care. I don't, um, I don't, sorry to bring it up. No, but it, it's really is. It's 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 guaranteeing we're going to get more bad Disney Star Wars. This brand is dead. It needs to be locked into a vault for a decade minimum. If it if it even has a chance, which it probably doesn't at this point, like every second they film does more damage to the original trilogy. And we have much and I mean, much more bad Star Wars than there is good Star Wars. Like it's it's at overwhelming yep. at this point. Yeah. The fact and that it, the people who adore this don't even agree on what it was. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they don't that shit drives me nuts they just saw some live action clone wars which which is what they wanted but what these are stories that are over you can't go back even if they did some stupid multiverse thing which i would not be surprised if they did mm -hmm. at all um th that would be the wor that would be the worst thing to happen to it and it's all going to eventually lead to disney remaking the original trilogy it's going to happen take it to the bank that's the only card they have left to play. They're not going to get rid of Star Wars. They're not going to sell it. Maybe Apple buys Disney. Sure. Uh, Apple's worse. Have you seen their commercials lately? Apple's <laughs> not worse than Disney. They're going to eliminate all carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and we'll all die. Really? Uh, Thanks, Apple. Really? Uh, how do you do that and still make batteries? Uh, I'm just curious because it takes electricity to make batteries. Uh, you got to dig into the ground. You got to get cobalt. You got to get all kinds of other stuff and the machines need to dig it. Right. Uh, well, I mean, they get the slaves to do it, but like the slaves produce carbon dioxide too. They fart and the methane and stuff. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how they're going to do that. Well, clearly, you know, they're going to produce airtight underwear that they, they all have to wear. So like the farts just get absorbed yeah. back into their bodies eventually. Well, that, that um, their but... mother nature certainly looked like she was using excess resources. I'm just going to say, I, I really enjoy eating steak and um, driving a car <laughs> that runs on petrol. It's great. Wow. No. You probably like to <laughs> fart as well. Yeah, I do occasionally. Yeah, I've been known to. <laughs> um, part of why I wanted to jump on the stream with you, Gary, was uh, I was going to talk about a comparison. I feel mm. it's particularly poignant, especially with how this episode is so fucking confusing in terms of what Ahsoka learned, where she is as a character, and where she is now. People keep talking about Ahsoka the White. Have you guys heard about this? Yeah, I heard about that theory. Yeah, and she is in white now. And it was she's really wearing white by the end of the episode. Weird, it's such a fucking her weird head bracelet thing. Hey, and, remember and when she, she went she into and came out of the water? She was baptized, and she could stand on the wing of her craft while it's whipping through the atmosphere without. Oh my god! Off. It's like well, at the end of Rebels, it rhymes. She's space Jesus. She's space oh, Jesus. Yeah. So they retconned. You, you know the end of Rebels, right? Nope. I've they seen the her. picture of she, her. Oh, don't care. You would have really was, bad Gandalf cosplay. Yes, yes. So she had her staff and everything, and they, I guess they retconned that. Um, wow. Yeah. I mean, Star Wars does borrow, like uh, George Lucas's Star Wars does borrow from a lot of things, including sure. Dune and Lord of the Rings. But uh, shut the fuck up with this Ahsoka the White stuff. So, <laughs> you, you see the, 
the, the bright light on her when she woke up again. And yeah. other people pointed this out. Like the, uh, it was a CG, like her headpiece was, was CG. Mm. It wasn't, it was part makeup, part CG. And it right. looked fucking terrible, like utterly terrible. Uh, and you know, there's, they say it's a hundred million dollars. Bullshit. It, it costs way more to make this. I'm guessing 200 million is probably the truth. Uh, dude, uh, I, I, they can do what they want. I, they got space whales now. Ahsoka the White. This is Star Wars is such a fucking. Joke, <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm putting my hand up so I can communicate with the space whales. Let us inside the Whoa. biggest space whale. Okay, open your mouth. Then when you accelerate, we don't smash into the back of your fucking mouth. Didn't she say that she wasn't sure it was going to take them where they wanted to go? Yeah. yeah, and she said, "I don't. They they know that where they're going to go." That's great. I hope so. You're only traveling between galaxies. <laughs> Literally being off by an inch would destroy everything. It's fine. <laughs> so, anyway, so what I was thinking about was a particular episode of good old Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Gary. It's an excuse oh. to talk about it. Yes. Remember the penultimate one in season five uh, called The Weight of the World? Mm -hmm. the, um, the whole season, Buffy's being chased by Glory, so who's a god. And it's it's quite a season for like the amount of shit they have to deal with. Loads of people get killed and crippled and destroyed and stuff. And they're at the end of their rope by the time you hit that episode and Dawn gets kidnapped by Glory. It's basically over. And you expect the normal thing is for Buffy to go like, all right, we're going to get an RPG to blow up the judge. Or we're going to find out like a secret way to kill this person. Or we're going to find out from their own, you know, subvert them with their friend, blah, blah. But no, she just, she just sinks down and she's frozen. And everyone else is like, what the fuck are you doing? Hello? We got we got shit to do. Hello, and then the whole the next episode, she's basically in a coma, and Willow has to go inside her head and figure out why. Now the episode, it, like Giles, immediately just says like it's 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 because of everything that's happened. That's why she's in a yeah. coma. It's like it's tough to deal with, and it's like yeah, as the audience, that makes a lot of sense. And then when you get in there, the first thing you find out from like Buffy's point of view is that she believes she killed Dawn, and of course the 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 easy read of that is like oh you mean like by failing as who you are you killed Dawn. By the end of the episode, you find out what she means by that is that there was a point in which she just gave up. She was, mm -hmm. uh, she was trying, and she just, for a second, thought, you know what? If Dawn died, things would be easier. It would just be, it would just be easier. And because she had that thought, she was so ashamed of herself. She basically thought, "I've just, I've just killed her because of the fact that I don't seem to care anymore." And Willow has to tell her, like, that's normal. You have like moments where you just give up. You have moments where you can't deal with the weight of the world, and that's okay. You can come back. The only thing that'll make Dawn actually die is if you just stay here wallowing in how you failed when you haven't yet. So get out there and fucking fight. That's the episode. Happens yep. across like a bunch of other plot stuff. It cuts in between, you know, Spike and Xander doing their own shit. And the Buffy scenes take up what, like seven minutes. Yep. The point is very clean, but they subvert you into thinking, you know, she's just failed. But it's like, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but it's still kind of the same thing. Nobody misunderstood the episode, <laughs> she, you know, and it moved right along. And I was just, I couldn't help but think about that episode when I was watching this one because I was like, oh, they're both partially suicidal. They both think that like their actions have led to other people dying and they both lost faith in their abilities like warriors and stuff. And that should they continue to fight and their respective uh, influences are telling them, yes, you need to fight. And I was just like, it's amazing how similar they are and yet how shit the Ahsoka one is, because it relies so heavily on the visuals, on the editing of like, oh, fuck, blaster sounds, oh, look, Clone I've seen people trying to figure out what episode of the Clone Wars specifically it's referencing. And I was like, why? Why are you what, doing what does more that work that change? Dave did? Who fucking cares? If you say like, oh, it's season five, episode 16, everybody, it's like, okie dokie. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, Tell me why I should give a shit. <laughs> like, please. Now, that was probably their their riff on on that Buffy episode too. You know that, right? <laughs> like oh, it, it, it does feel like this is a hollow photocopy of other yeah. TV show episodes. Yeah. The the only positive thing I can say is like the young actress that they got to play young Ahsoka was she was way good. fucking better than Rosario Dawson was. I agree. Yeah. I don't she know what's been going on with Rosario. Season. She's she's been a brick throughout this whole thing. Yeah. And we know, like, it's not because she can't act; it's just because, like, she's just not giving it anything. No, it's Dave uh, Filoni. It's the savior. Uh, he doesn't know how to direct actors, uh, maybe voice actors, but not like real life ones that move around. And now you see a lot more Dave Filoni in past Disney Star Wars shows too. I'm seeing a lot of similarities hmm. in this that I saw in 
Mandalorian season three, including long walks up corridors and hmm. up runways to ships and just staring that that's him. I think that's largely him. I, I'm not sure how much hands on Favre. I'm not going to apologize for Favreau because he made some shit too. But yeah, uh, yeah dude, um, it, it, this is the best we're going to get from Disney Star Wars. Mm. That. So, so, so my question here about this show, and you guys have to prognosticate around this, is Thrawn. Like, is he just going to be the cliffhanger punchline, or is there actually going to be some plot? Uh, I think I mean, next they're, episode they're we'll get nothing. Time. And then they're there's a two-parter through. ending with Thrawn, probably. Yeah. Okay. Like Thrawn, yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll get a door open, it'll be Thrawn at the end of next episode, something like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. West, they, West. they have waited so long, like, there's nothing that they can bring in, and in the time that they've got left, that's going to be satisfying. It's going to have to be season uh, You know what, they can, they, they can bring in some men. <laughs> there's no fucking well, men. So the sad the fucking reality <laughs> is that most people like Ray Stevenson, and we know we can't get any more than three episodes of him now. It's, right. That'll be it. Yep. The, the, the super sad reality is that even if he was still alive, it's very likely this character's going to get killed off. Off very mm. soon you don't want him to overshadow thrawn the same for elspeth whatever the fuck i expect her shin and balin to be dealt with uh more than likely i don't, don't know, know man i could see happen. i could see thrawn ultimately bowing down before elspeth because oh, fucking she's better hell. Than him. i don't put it past them do not put it past them i i, I can see a door or. opening and he comes out of the shower with just a towel on I, I could see I you know what you meant, see man. them doing a shock master where he just like stumbles through a wall and falls over. <laughs> like, hey, I'm glad you guys finally showed up. up. Oh, I've yeah. been stuck out here in space. Oh, it's been lonely. Yeah, it might just be like they see him as a false prophet or something, and they realize that like uh, Morgan's actually better than him in every way. It good just good it God. sounds dumb as I say it, but I would not put it past uh, Disney Lucasfilm at this point. He's gone hermit. Like, what are you guys doing here? Like, fuck off. Go away. And Ezra, well, Ezra as well. Like, he's obviously a major point. So who's Ezra? Uh, Tell me. Motivation. Well, yeah. Uh, like, you never guy. knew anything about he's Rebels. He's a tiny hologram. He's a tiny hologram. Okay. That's what he was. This is, this is the thing. Like, Dave, I think, assumes that everyone who's watching this is a fucking massive fan of Rebels and knows it inside and out. It's like, it's a no, they're not. Like, Assume your audience is coming at this fresh and Correct. give them enough to work with. That's like the basic rule of writing something like that. I don't this. think Dave Filoni has ever left the buildings at Lucasfilm. I think he sleeps there with his dogs <laughs> and uh, he just listens to the people at Lucasfilm and is convinced that everybody's seen like, a, you know, 50 million people have seen Rebels and Clone Wars, which is not the case, by the way. But how many people have attacked watching reruns you? reruns of Rebels all day well, long. Uh, how many people <laughs> have uh, attacked you for... Uh, saying that um, you needed to see these other shows to be able to understand the show. And they go, well, yeah, this show is for us. It's not for you people who don't know the series. Okay, you're right. You win. You're right. It's for you. <laughs> Probably explains why no one's fucking watching it. Well, yeah. that's right. Um, I just to bring back to a point that you made earlier, Gary, um, from Abscon 2, who says they already remade A New Hope with Force Awakens. There were so many parallels there. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Exactly right. Yeah, they they've done a soft remake of it already, which is, yeah, that's JJ at work. Why why use imagination when you can just uh, remake what someone else has already done? When you can make a show that's about itself, uh, you yeah. know, Robert Meyer Burnett pointed that out with both Star Trek and Star Wars. Now, like they're not about anything other than themselves, and it's just self referential <laughs> crap. And it, it's bad already. enough. We 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 kind of liked it when there were pop culture references. Remember way back when? Uh, remember um, uh, Reservoir Dogs when they oh, were yeah. talking about like Silver Surfer? There was a Silver Surfer poster, you know. Like it's it's and and remember when they talked about it in um uh, was it? Oh my God! What did they have the big Silver Surfer argument? Oh, in, in um, Crimson Tide. Crimson Tide. Remember we liked those little little nuggets and then it just became everything and now it's just referencing yourself all the time just stop it already okay just tell me a fucking story i don't care about the, the old story <laughs> that i like that i've watched a lot of times that i probably know better than you i'd like to see a new story now uh but that's that you know you've talked about it. we've all talked about it the, the the writers now have no experience they have no. none their only experience is watching YouTube clips of movies. I doubt they watched the entire movie. Nobody at Star Trek, at Kurtzman Trek, watched an entire fucking episode of the original series. There's no fucking way. Uh, will, they just used to work on it because they know dick about it. I will well, say they, well, uh, go ahead. No, I'm just saying they they don't have the same references as 
as George did. I mean, I, I, I mentioned that George was influenced by, you know, we all know Flash Gordon, uh, 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 you know, the other dude, Buck, uh, Roger. Buck Roger, Buck Rogers, Hidden Fortress. Mm -hmm. And so these, his Star, Star Wars was an homage to that. Now the present people, Star Wars is an homage to itself. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. the problem. It's the well, snake and the other... its own tail and it's, it's gradually running out of snake. Yeah. The other half of it as well is the you guys have I assume have seen what is being talked about about this episode so much. It's Anakin and Vader, Vader and Anakin, Anakin, Vader, Vader, Anakin, Anakin, Vader, 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 Vader. Just like seeing him. Everyone's sharing those two moments where you see Vader's silhouette slash him in smoke. And they're talking about how it's the greatest shit ever. And I was just like, man, no wonder they make this this way. Why wouldn't they? I don't know why they wouldn't have a full TV show of Vader at this point, just walking around slashing and swishing his lightsaber. So have they found their modern audience then? Um, I don't know how profitable all of this is. It's just that oh. watching critical praise be, I love seeing Vader. <laughs> you know, like it's unreal, man. And like it, I told you, there are some accounts out there who are trying to write essays about how meaningful this episode is. But like I said, they're all over the place. And there's barely anything to draw from the episode itself in terms of lines of dialogue or, you know, visual metaphor. The fact, like I said, film Twitter if I find it embarrassing that this is a shot being rewarded for its meaning when it's just Anakin is a character, Vader is the person he became. Can you tell? Because right. there's Vader in there. He's got a red lightsaber. Like, what are you supposed to draw from that? I saw some people saying, like, well, what are you supposed to have said is a, it's it's Ahsoka's conflict. She's seeing the two men because that's who she re is representative to her. It's like that you you need to actually fucking flickery flash vader in order to get that across you kidding me i know well also what are you trying to say with that how does that like what does that tell us about her character where does it take her there's nothing there it's just Not, it's nothing surface flash I, it's just stuff that you remember yep. it's just like random images random characters will bring back a familiar actor that that's all it is. There's no cohesive no, like, story nothing. thread that ties it together. Nothing. I would put money on Rosario Dawson's performance not changing a single bit, despite this apparently being the most important Ahsoka episode in the history of Star Wars. But how much of that yeah. is her fault, and how is it that she's been directed? And considering Ray Stevenson managed to pull off what I think was a pretty decent performance, despite the shitty script, I feel like that all of okay. the actors could do it. And that I, I know that she can do it, but maybe she doesn't, she just can't be bothered. Or there is a chance, by the way, that she was told to play this stoic, and this is her interpretation of that. I, I think it, I think that's what they, they went I, for. That, I that's know my guess. She can, she can deliver good performances. I fucking know she can. I know Mary Elizabeth Winstead can do it. I, I just think they've been shittily directed. I think they've been told, like, you have to be strong, you have to be stoic, you have to be wise and thoughtful, and you have to take five minute pauses between sentences <laughs> because that's gonna like give you gravitas like geez, they've been told to do that and they've just delivered what they were asked to do uh it's it's uh, shitty when you see it on screen but that's that's what they were given i guess i i think they're better than 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 that actually and the the lines are horrible i think when, when i heard anakin say time to die i fucking lost it <laughs> oh dude <laughs> time to die <sighs> Who, who writes that? That's not Star Wars dialogue. That's something else. That's Some fucking space dialogue. Yeah, like what well, we remember. Klingon. Prequels. That's there Klingon were, dialogue. There was dialogue there that we can all. It is a good time well. to die. <laughs> hick, well, as hick, a, hawk, look. As an, well, it's like it's like Blade Runner. It's like wake up, time to die. <laughs> and just to make everybody mad, because why not? Uh, one of my biggest problems with Anakin. In the prequels, was he never sounded like Darth Vader? Not for one second. There's not for one second that I believe that kid turned into the Darth Vader who fucked with Luke in The Empire Strikes Back. Had little pithy comments. Uh, it just it never matched up to me. Ever. It was the it was the vocoder in the helmet. Uh, they must have been well, right. The the whole no, thing I, I doesn't match up that. because the Anakin that you see in these flashbacks is way more like wise and restrained and controlled than the Anakin that we got in the prequels. Mm -hmm. But this is meant to be between episodes two and three, I guess. Dude, it's always been a huge thorn in Star Wars's canon that the Clone Wars series is supposed to be between like episodes two and three. Because you watch episodes two and three, and someone says like, "What do you think of Ahsoka?" They're like. What? And then you get told about this character that is so incredibly important to the story and to Anakin, and you're like, how has this never come up in the fucking movies? And you're like, because yeah. it wasn't 
a thing. <laughs> like they made it on its own, and now it's evolved into this huge. It's like a growth that is is intertwining itself in the main line of movies, and it keeps rolling around every few years. And all of the fucking mainline fans are like, "Yeah, sure, Ahsoka, sure, yeah, what." What does any of this mean? <laughs> it's like, well, you gotta watch eight seasons of the fucking show if you want to know. No, thanks. I, I watched them. I don't remember a bunch of them. I, I, I it just was. I started. No one does. I started. I couldn't handle it. It's a cartoon. It like with all cartoons and like comics, they count until they don't count. They can count in your right. head all day long, but unless it gets mentioned in the live action movie, it don't count. Uh, now I, we have streaming shows. I don't even. I, I, they're, they they have you can't unmake the soup on this one now they have fucked it up beyond recognition and it takes a lot of work to yeah. fuck something up like star wars it does so credit to disney i, I feel like it's they been illustrated how easy it is to satisfy fans with with star wars they had to work very hard to piss everyone off for fuck's sake the force awakens was pretty well liked when it came out i i hated it it was no, a lot of people hated it to be fair but like Star Wars was healthy for a yes. moment. And yeah, then for it, a moment, yeah. Yep. No, made a lot of money. It was absolutely loved. Uh, it made me question my like my taste in film. I'm like, maybe I've lost it. Maybe it's me. I'm just not seeing it, how good this is. And you know, you well, could I was still there. Draw I was definitely it there with Lost Jedi. Have, you could still have like... fixed it, sort of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fixing it now is it's looking pretty impossible. Well, without like a full-on retcon, of like half the Star Wars history at this point, like what can you do to fix it? It's, it's a funny question because it's like, Drigger, where, where are we starting from? Which fucking era? Because we keep adding to all of the ones we're familiar with. They will shove as many stories in between each of like the OT prequel, Clone Wars, Rebel timeline, and now between the OT and the sequels. And it's just like, where are we starting? Where the fuck are we? Like, so... Where does the fixing begin? Well, well they, they ask, okay, so if imagine more, you're the surgeon with the scalpel, and it's like we've got this cancer growing within uh, within Star Wars, and it's metastasized. We need to operate immediately. Uh, what would you preserve at this point? Like, if you could just cut away everything that you that was just shit and it had zero value, um, in the series. Like, what would you what would you cut away and what would you retain at this point? So obviously, I'm keeping the OT. Uh, yeah. yeah. The, there's a question mark over the prequels because on one hand I can keep them because they generate a lot off them that's really really good and they themselves have some stuff I quite like about them but if I was to cut them out we can remake them you know and and basically follow the, most of the structure but just tweak with the uh, actors dialogue and stuff and uh, you know like for example like Count Dooku we can't have Christopher Lee but maybe in this scenario I can because we're doing like God mode but even if we couldn't Charles Dance is right there he can play Count Dooku okay <laughs> And uh, Always Charles Dance. we can, you know, kids. we could do that. And then, and then from there, this is what it is because it's kind of like, it reminds me of like Marvel, where it's like, what's the solution? It's like, we got a clean house. This infection is deep. And uh, it started a long time ago, sort of thing. It's like, wipe out basically all of Disney stars. And if someone said, like, whoa, and or two, I'd be like, yes, <laughs> wipe it I, all I out. I think I could, I could live with a certain amount of it like i would keep the ot obviously i would probably keep the prequels for better or worse i think they, they do the job that's required of them they don't do it very well it ain't pretty but it's done it's world building um, yeah i would probably keep rogue one bizarrely because like it doesn't destroy too much it just kind of like uh, gives you like another perspective on the events leading up to a new hope so i don't i, I could live with rogue one being a thing uh, and so I could probably live with Andor as well, because you're in that sort of pre that prequel period. That's okay. Uh, anything beyond that, I think I would probably just kill. I would uh, I would just decanonize it. I think there's nothing else worth saving. <clears throat> what about Clone Wars and Rebels? You keeping them, Drinker? Don't give a shit. <laughs> I take them or leave them, I guess. Like I they, they seem like they're pretty inoffensive one way or the other. So like if people feel strongly that they want to keep them, like, okay, the drinker is a benevolent dictator, so he will spare them this time. But yeah, I, I wouldn't care that much whether Clone Wars or Rebels were kept. I mean the fact is if we have this own power level, I just want to shore up everything to the point where I might even say, Can we uh, can we tweak Return of the Jedi? You know, because that movie could use a little bit of help in certain yeah. aspects. Like yeah, just might saying. change the Ewoks yeah. into into Wookies. 
You yeah, could, we could. Yeah, we could do convince stuff Harrison there. Ford to put in a good acting performance. He's t- <laughs> Just give a bit more for the characters, yeah. like Han. You know. Uh, yeah. Uh, I would. If, is this God mode? You said God mode. Uh, I'd wipe it all out except for the original trilogy. Uh, adapt Revenge of the Sith novel as the trill as the prequels. Uh, because the novelization for Revenge of the Sith is fucking great. Uh, you mm-hmm. get into Anakin's head and you see like how he's torn apart by the Jedi and uh, them making him question this father figure of Palpatine, which you never get in the movie. You never get that feeling in the movie, but in the books you do because you're in his head. Uh, and you could do that with more characterization and probably a better director than the billionaire George Lucas, who directed from his uh, folding chair drinking a Pepsi. Uh, love George, but uh, yeah, he, other people should have directed that movie. Uh, and then I would have, you know, and kept the EU, I'd have kept the EU, just adapt that. Yeah, well, I think that seems to be a unanimous thing yeah. amongst fans. It's like the EU, was yeah, adapt pretty it, good. Get, yeah. Get, get them in the movies, get them in the TV show, all the best stuff, shore them up as well. So, yeah, well, imagine if we got a sequel trilogy that was based on like the EU because you know, we we, we had Luke and Mara Jade and stuff, like there was like worlds of stories right there. And most of it was endorsed by George, wasn't it? Like he was aware of most of what this stuff was and he signed off on it. Yes. George signed off on a lot of it. I, I know like uh, our good friend Ryan Kinnell is pumping his fist in vindication because he has hated Dave Filoni and the Clone Wars since uh, <laughs> three. So he's like, yes, told you. Oh, yeah. This this is it felt that way for me as well. I've been trying to explain that Filoni is not going to be the one that can do it. But I feel like all of us have to some extent had these different moments of like why do you guys think it Favreau for Star Wars for Lodi for this Star Wars as well just this the, this wasn't it you might have thought it was it but it ain't it it's never going to be it there's always going to be another dream of another person who's going to save Star Wars and they're not going to do it they're just going to be another hack getting the Lord of the Rings told- better franchise <laughs> yeah. there you go better trilogy better franchise I'll even watch The Hobbit before I watch the prequels give it to Ava DuVernay Fight me. Uh, yeah, oh, well, you know, uh, she's the answer to everything. I think uh, so. Ava DuVarnish, uh, <laughs> you're racist if you liked Oppenheimer over her movie. Yeah, apparently oh, yeah. I Wasn't am. Wasn't it some obscure, like, pure, like, some obscure journalist is like, oh, why are people more interested in this than, like, the guy who literally changed the course of human history? Uh, it's, a ma- yeah. it's, a, it's a mystery. Um, the guy who blew some shit up. We like it when people blow shit up. I mean, it's sad for Japan, but, well, you know, also- history. Well, also when it's made by a director who's really fucking good at what he does. Pretty generally. popular director. Pretty yep. popular yeah. guy, I'll say. Yeah. Uh, it's funny as well because, like, um, Nia da Costa was talking about the Marvels and um, how she's really worried that this film isn't going to be successful purely because the, the stars can't come out and promote it. Uh, and so <laughs> she's. <laughs> this it. is what. We, this people is what we call managing expectations. It's like we're we're already going to set up our excuses so we can deflect blame when this thing fucking flops. Uh, well, so now she can just say, "Well, if nobody comes to watch this movie, it's not because it's garbage, and it's not because nobody cares about superhero movies anymore, and it's not because the MCU is on its last legs. It's because Brie Larson and whoever else was in this fucking shit show wasn't able to come out and promote it on the red carpet." <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Okay, Nia. We no, she. You. you know what? She did kind of hint at the idea that maybe superhero movies have run their course, and now they just have to be good. She was almost there. Yes. She was so close. So close. So close. She can't um, say it publicly. She probably knows it in her head. She knows the game's up. She knows no one cares about this crap anymore. <laughs> And it's time to just damage control it before moving chat, into something. By else. the way, chat. I know the Harbor is garbage, but Hobbit has better acting, directing, music, and everything. It just does. It's, it's it doesn't have a better story, but it has better acting, better music, and in some cases, better directing. There's a pretty there's, there's a fan edit of the the Hobbit out there, like the Phantom edit. That's really freaking. Oh, good. the Phantom edit is great. I, I think actually, it's fantastic. Love it. You, see if I have to come up with a metaphor for the Hobbit. It's Christopher Lee being in this movie, who looks like a plastic mannequin, uh, just sitting at a table. But then he, he jumps up looks, and fights like a ninja, and it's fucking yeah. awesome. <laughs> you know? It's awesome, I it. <laughs> but you know it's not him. And you're you know just it's like, not oh, him. Uh, everything hey, about this is so fucking fake. And I'm plasticky. sure. I'm sure you heard uh, Critical Drinker 
what I heard about the Marvel's uh, testing. Um, I did because I was on the same group chat as you. Yeah, you're, <laughs> yeah. I, not I good. Know. So much it for was... being coy. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, we were on the same group chat, and we heard that. Uh, well, why don't you tell me? It's your show. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, well, apparently, it has test uh, with test audiences. It's tested the worst out of any Marvel movie ever that's been made. This is apparently the worst. Hmm. Out of uh, all MCU films, we're, we're talking. Is, how is that possible? This, Doctor well, Strange, from, Eternals, yeah. <laughs> and this is from pretty reliable sources that Gary and I both trust. Yes, and that's the that's the take on it. It's um, had the worst test screenings out of any Marvel movie ever, and I, I can't say I'm surprised because everything we've seen in the trailer just screams fucking bomb. <laughs> like this is this is not going to be a successful movie. No. Oh, no. speaking of not successful movie, uh, uh, did did you see Aquaman two trailer? <laughs> oh, I haven't seen the trailer yeah, yet. I'm not yet. I was going to oh. talk about this actually. Oh my god, it's the Big Lebowski two, but underwater. Yeah. So I mean, there's there's a lot of headlines during the rounds uh, about this. Apparent, like the studio has essentially like abandoned all hope. Ye who enter here um, with this movie. Um, they have pretty much pulled all their advertising funding, but it says here, this is from the Daily Mail, so you know you know it's legit. Um, <laughs> Aquaman and Lost Kingdom, rumored to be abandoned by Warner Brothers with no full trailers. Well, we've now got it uh, just three months before its theatrical release. Like, So we're only now just starting to get these trailers for it, and there's very little like promotion for it. It, it looks horrible. Uh, yeah, with just over three months left before Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom hits theaters on December 20th, the lack of any type of marketing has fueled rumors that Warner Brothers is essentially abandoning the film. Uh, it's a follow-up to Warner Brothers' 2018 smash hit Aquaman, which took in 1.14 billion worldwide, which still baffles me. Um, yep, we've got Jason Momoa returning and Amber Heard, who everyone's excited to see. Um yeah, during to the ongoing writers and actors strikes, they're forbidding people from, or the actors, from promoting their work. Um, yeah, Warner Brothers have got Dune 2, which is, uh, well, that's been pushed back till next year so that they can actually try and promote this. The general gist, the general idea seems to be that uh, they know it's going to flop. They're not going to waste money at like trying to promote something that they know is going to fail. So there's no point like throwing good money after bad. Uh, and this movie is just going to be like tossed to the wolves. Really. And it's an interesting, it's an interesting bookend. We started off with one piece and maybe we're ending with uh, um, the, the Aquaman, but in the trailer, at least you've got a lead character that doesn't want to be Aquaman. And, and yeah, I'm yeah. tired of that. Like th this is bullshit. This is what it, drives well, I... me nuts. How many times have you seen a trailer for any superhero movie and just thought I'm tired of this now? It's just yeah. the same shit that we've had like a dozen But I'm talking about a lead before. character that doesn't want to embrace their hero, superhero status. Like it's tiresome. Correct me if I'm wrong, but he didn't want to be Aquaman in uh fucking Justice League. He didn't want to be Aquaman and Aquaman. So he, yeah. he doesn't want to be Aquaman and Aquaman too. This sounds like Thor. Yeah. Sounds like yeah, he's got to go Thor and find again. himself again. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it it feels it's the dude. Yeah, it, it's like a lot of these characters are just stuck in a rut because they don't know what to do with them. And the whole genre is just stale and played out and boring now because they've run out of ideas. They've run out of interesting character arcs. They've run out of interesting uh, worlds to explore. It's just a, a genre at the end of its time. Uh, yep. And it's kind of sad to see, but like, well, I'm ready for it to stop now. Yep. They turned it into a genre, which was their biggest mistake because superheroes and comic books are a medium with multiple genres. Mm. Uh, but you've made it into yep. this just this, this you know, one note thing CGI that you're into the ground. It's all CGI. The, the, by the way, I just saw the preview for the trailer, it looked like garbage. So, uh, the, the, is, the issue of superhero fatigue, uh, it doesn't really matter what came first, the chicken or the egg with superhero fatigue, it's here. Like it's undeniable, it's here, and now even if you make a really effing good one, it won't do as well as it should have. 
Guardians 3, it's debatable like how great it was, but they had a terrible first weekend. That is superhero fatigue. Batman, the Batman, a Batman movie didn't sniff a billion dollars. That is superhero fatigue. Well, you could say, well, the movie wasn't that great. I would agree. I would agree. But it's still a Batman movie. And if you go back and look relatively to Superman and Batman, which most people hate, uh, that thing made a lot of money. The Suicide or Suicide Squad made a lot of money. There was still a lot of excitement for superheroes. We're seeing that as excitement erode. So, uh, yes, too many bad films made superhero fatigue. And now, like, even if you get a Superman movie, people are going to roll their eyes. Uh, You know, the the general public's going to go, oh, fuck again. It's the thing about a rising tide. Like, it's the tide of superhero, you know, stuff. You can take it all up to a the, the, the ceiling and the floor for success is lowering and uh, shortening depending on what point of time we're in. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I my take on, on it has always been like superhero fatigue was always going to come eventually. Yep. It was just a question of when. It could have been staved off for a few more years for sure if they maintained a, a good pace of quality. Uh, they, they had uh, started to branch out into different genres and experimenting with it a little bit, but they haven't done it. It's just been cookie cutter, standard superhero stories that usually culminated in a, a portal or a sky beam with a world ending threat and a bad guy who wants to destroy things for whatever reason. And the good guy has to rally and fight him in a big soulless CGI climax. That's what they've done every single fucking time. Uh, and what you can only do that so many times before people just get bored. And like I say, you could have like delayed it for a, a few more years and milked it a bit more, but they had so little imagination. They just did the same standard thing every time and people just, it just hastened the end. And that's I'm, where we're I, at now. I'm actually surprised that they <sighs> did manage to run it into the ground. Like uh, at, at the peak of it, I, I was happy to see more of it. Yeah. At the peak of it, you could have had, real, you could have had Blue Beetle come out and it would have made 500 million easily. Yep. Because people would have just been enthusiastic about any superhero movie, but we're not living in that world now. We've seen the same thing so many times; they're bored. And now we're in, we're in a world where this year we're going to have eight superhero movies that have gotten released between uh, DC and Marvel, and only two of them are actually going to turn a profit. So let me let two me ask you a question. So let me ask you a question: If the Netflix Daredevil series never existed with all the ennui that we're in the middle of it, and I'm using a French word for you. Whoa. Thank I you. know what ennui, ennui means. You're not that smart. <laughs> and uh, and if the first season of Daredevil, Netflix Daredevil, came out now, fresh, marketed, do you think it would be as successful? No. <sighs> it, would st- it would still be well-received. I- it wouldn't be as successful as it had been at the time it came out. Because just because we've seen so much of it, okay, I did, I there would definitely be a rec- there would definitely be. a recognition that is better than the most of the stuff that we've gotten. But I think when you've just had so many generic superhero stories told, um, even if you get a good one, it's not going to get as much attention and as much praise as it would have done at the beginning when there was just a lot of general enthusiasm. There was, but there was also context. So I, I think it's timeless. I think it would have been a successful, but it wouldn't have saved like the medium, the genre. It would have been just this anomaly that's good and everything else is going to be shit. But in context, what, you know, it's funny you bring that up because I was thinking about it. They were really going in the right direction after the Avengers, right? So they they grounded everything with Daredevil and they had all the aftermath of, all, you know, the Kingpin and these, gov- these organizations rising into power. And it's an escalation that could have happened over time that could have led to Dr. Doom or something, you know, something earthbound. Uh, that's what they did in the comics. They'd have big space battles, but then we ground everything for a little while. Then they'd have these big space battles, especially Marvel, right? That's, that's where, where Marvel had, or they would have them simultaneously while civil war is going on. You had all the galactic heroes kind of going off in annihilation or you had world war Hulk or, or you had planet Hulk uh, that led, led into world war Hulk, but you had something escalate up to it that took a lot of time and if you're going to do serialized storytelling which is what comic books are Mm -hmm. uh, they're they're made for tv they actually are made for tv and they shouldn't be fighting uh big giant beams of light or cg monsters at the end all the time no they're fighting men uh they're fighting people you know uh dr doom you know we have galactus and thanos but dr doom is the number one villain 
in Marvel. He's a dude in a metal suit. Uh, that that should be your main villain. Uh, Jessica uh, Jones was an unbelievable first season with a yeah. tenant as the just. Uh, oh my God, that was a psychological. I almost didn't it make was. it. And that. dude, I ran into her at the. Uh, th there was a Comic Con in Austin when I was leaving for the UK. So I, I'm going in the Austin airport. I run in the uh, Terry Metalis and Jonathan Frakes in an elevator, which was awesome. Got to meet <laughs> Riker. And then we did ran. Did you make we, out with, with Jonathan Frakes? Uh, I did. We, we made out. <laughs> um, no. And then I ran into Kristen Ritter, who's fucking tall. She's like, really? really? She's like freakishly tall. Yeah. She's like 6'2. Wow. Oh shit! Yeah. Like I checked. Height. I'm like, is she wearing like he, me? And my my wife saw her. She's like, look at how big she is. I'm like, oh, she is, and she's not wearing like heels. She's like really tall. Uh, but yeah, like I liked the first season of Jessica Jones. It was really good. Uh, you know, the first half of Luke Cage was really good. By the way, one of the writers for One Piece wrote for Nick Cage. Luke Cage. Nick hmm. Cage. Luke Cage. Nick. Not Nick Cage. I think it was Hell, Iron Cage, Fist no. where it all started to fall apart. Really, Nick well. Cage is Iron Fist. Yes, you're right. Uh, Nick Cage is Luke Cage. Would be awesome. Nick Cage is Luke Cage. Let's let's make this happen. <laughs> Cage versus Cage. Cage versus Cage. In no, a cage uh, match. But th like that was when Feige was under control. Uh, Ike Perlmutter, who they made this like horrible villain, right? Was uh, you know he was a dollars and cents guy, right? But like Marvel was under his control. Once Kevin Feige got full control, and that was right around when Civil War came out, that's when things went to shit. And yeah. it became the Kevin Feige show. Yeah, I was just curious. I was just curious <clears throat> your opinion on whether some of that <laughs> that older stuff would, would play now. I, if it was mm, good. I think Daredevil's timeless. Go back and like I just went back and rewatched it. It's it's fantastic. It's, it's the best thing Marvel live action has ever done. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, without a doubt. Far and away. Far and away. I, I'd put uh, Jessica Jones up there a close second. That thing creeped creep me right out. I think season one of The Punisher and Daredevil were like top tier. Jessica Jones was right behind. Uh, Luke Cage was fine. It was a bit bland, but you know, I could live with it. They lost Iron the bad Fist. guy after the first three well, seasons. Cottonmouth, yeah. After, yeah. They got rid of Cotton. after they got rid of him and got into Robo Black Guy, that was terrible. Yep. Um, <laughs> Iron Fist was. Really, I think no, they, no, I don't know if they picked the wrong actor for that. Only, that was bad. Yeah. That was I only watched Daredevil, so I can't speak to any of this. I just I've been told basically to avoid. <laughs> like, wasn't Defenders even didn't work out so well, right? Yeah, yeah. Defenders was shit. Um, it was it was a shame. But just before we go on, I know Paul, you've uh, you've run out of time, unfortunately. Yes, I, I have, but, and I'll leave you with this one thing that someone sent me. Speaking of Ahsoka fans. I love it when old people get mad at things younger people like. I really hope I don't turn out like that and just let the young ones enjoy the media without uh, the uh, of saying back in my day. There you go. Fuck is... you, young ones. <laughs> you don't deserve to enjoy things because you're young and stupid. This is, is the abuse I citizen. get. This what is the what, abuse what are they I criticizing get? you for? Having taste that you don't like some things. <laughs> like, no, I... Oh, well. I have been told many times that I'm old. I'm not allowed to watch their stuff. She's not 5'10 because I stood next to her and I'm six foot. <laughs> so <laughs> she might be lying. <laughs> so. Anyways, gentlemen, thank you very much. We'll see you later, Gary. At hey, the end of the see month. you later. And you, uh, thank you. Invite me. I'm uh, happy to be uh, you know, join this uh, staff if you'll have me. I really appreciate the intelligent conversation that you guys provide. Yeah. Thank Cheers. You. That's a lie. We're not that intelligent, but we appreciate no, you having, on, having you on, and uh, you raise the intelligence level. So <laughs> it's because of my Apple T-shirt. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Part of the solution. Finally. So, so long, guys. Later, Thanks, Paul. Man. Later, Thanks, Paul. I got to jump out too because my uh, I I only brought one adapter, right? So it's a it's plugged into my my soundboard, and I'm going off a of battery on my laptop. That's how. Oh, no, oh, no, you run it out. <laughs> well, because I'm in France, and your plugs are. Fuck, they're different than the UK. Yeah. No, I wasn't gonna bring it. They don't, make, they don't make sense to us either. Yeah. No, but. it's all crazy. I'm sorry, I got to go though. I, I'm uh, glad that Diago uh, Smokey moved because I was worried yeah. that Smokey was dead. Wait, wait, I can make him do it again. Watch this, That's Smokey. Right. You want to go outside for a walk? Oh my god, he did a little bit. That's a good boy. Yeah. That's terrible. <laughs> you just lie. He's like fuck you in your walk. Yeah, he's Lies. a great hound. He knows he's not going to go. Good dog. Hey, thanks for inviting me on, guys. Uh, no. It was I miss you guys. So, 
I no miss you problem. too, Gary. I want to hug you again like I did. Yeah. In hey, dude, thanks for coming out to the meetup. That was freaking brilliant. You're a rock star. And uh, I, everybody had a good time, man. They were so happy to see you. So thanks for coming out. Really appreciate yeah. it. Thanks, man. Uh, next time I'm out in the States, we'll hang again. We'll Hell hang. yeah. And Mahler. Yeah. I'm sure we'll talk about Ahsoka a lot more. Oh, we've got plenty of real BBC episodes to come. Yes, we do. So, again, thanks for having me on. Love being on Open Bar. Hail to the critical chat out there. And uh, listen, stay with these guys. They're really smart and good and fun. I'll, I'll keep listening, too. Ooh. We'll keep you entertained for a little while longer. Yeah. Thanks, Gary. Cheers. Appreciate it, man. Um, yeah, there's a super nope. chat that came in here from Philip Gamer, who said that's a uh, hail drinker, longtime watcher, first time chatter. And this for a hundred dollars said, I was just curious if you would be willing to watch the anime Attack on Titan. Cheers. That's been recommended to me many a time, and I'm definitely interested in watching it. I Wasn't there watch... um, a few years ago a controversy? Was it in the manga or the anime portion that the storytelling choice was made and everyone was like, oh, I don't know if it was. I don't know. I don't understand that world. I'm just, I feel like I'm peering into this grimy window and like I'm <laughs> slightly drunk and my vision's unfocused, so I can just see little bits of it occasionally. Um, so I don't well, know what the ins and outs of the, the anime and manga world are. It's probably safe to say that it's uh, recommended still heavily, I think, by a lot of people. So, yeah. Is, yeah, there's essentially like Demon Slayer anime, there's uh, Attack on Titan, and there's Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. Like, yeah. Those seem to be the big three that I should definitely watch if I do nothing else with my life. And I probably won't. So, And I've seen can... FMA Brotherhood, so I can recommend it. You'd like it. Well, yeah, I, I've seen uh, I've seen all of us are dead, and I think you'd like that. But you know, I've seen one punch. Wait, well, you said you saw one punch bad as well, right? <laughs> what what have you, I seen? Sorry, do you see? Have you seen one punch bad as well? No, I haven't. No. Oh, there you go. That's, that's, that's my counter recommendation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Stop. Recommending keep recommending things. until someone runs out, and then that's the loser or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, like uh, we've got a little bit of time left. Why don't we do a few super chats since we're here? Yeah. All righty. So the first one is from Mr. Luca and says, Drinker, can you show fellow Brits still game? Yes. Oh, man. Mm -hmm. This, this. I don't know if you're even aware that this is a show which exists, but uh, still game is a, a sitcom based in Scotland. It's about a bunch of pensioners living in Glasgow. Doesn't sound oh. like the most thrilling stuff, but man, they, they had some crackers in there hmm. i i definitely recommend it i think you would really enjoy it um, right, fair enough yeah still game is really good uh lc le pen says Moller, i second gary's motion for a one piece breakdown on efap i appreciate analysis without knowing the source plus a great who does would be fine so i was thinking about it um obviously rags and Fringy would need to see all of it which they haven't yet and that um there's a lot of different breakdowns of things. We we tend to go for extremes. Either we particularly have a lot of issues with it, or that we particularly like it. One Piece, as I've said, I I find it a hell of a lot of fun, and I think that there's plenty to compliment in terms of characterization and journeys. But I still I, I don't think I like it as much as um, Gary, for instance. Like I'm sitting on like a solid six seven ish. Like overall, for my assessment of like, the, there's still a lot of stuff. Like I was saying to Gary, like there's a hell of a lot of coincidences in it to to make certain things happen. That's like, yeah, hey, but you know, we got the characters in the right place, right? And it's like, yeah, sure. And then there's pieces of dialogue I'm not a huge fan of, but also pieces of dialogue that I'm a really big fan of. So it's like this weird balance of stuff that I'm super into and stuff that I'm like, eh, that could be. <laughs> so it's not. It feels in this awkward position where my passions are like split. And so um, when you do a breakdown of something that's eight episodes at an hour each, that's going to take a very long time. And I'm, I'm just not passionate enough about it. Uh, sorry, you've had uh, one piece to probably give it the correct, like the, the respectful treatment it, it would deserve. That's probably for someone else to do, right? Like I got some other stuff I'd rather cover. Yeah. No, I think that's a pretty reasonable take. And like, yeah, if you don't feel as strongly as you need to, to like cover it for a, a really like lengthy period of time, yeah, fair enough. Don't don't do it. Um, yeah, I like this. Red Dwarf, best series. Yeah, I think I've actually uh, bought the collection for that now. 
I so. think maybe you and I, like, because I would happily watch a few episodes with you. Like, I, I can pick out probably some of my favorites and just go through them. Or if you, you really want, you could just watch them all sequentially. You know, it's not, <laughs> it's not, it's not a show that's big on continuity, put it that way. Like, it doesn't, uh-huh. like, you don't have to watch every single episode in sequence to understand what's going on. It's pretty, like, you know, self contained. But, there's there's some great moments I would just love to see your reaction live, you know, from a comedy point of view, because I think you would you would really appreciate it if you like, um, you know, if you like things like Blackadder and stuff. I think you would really enjoy Red Dwarf. All right, yeah. Um, Elsie Le Pen also says, but yeah, apparently season two has already been scripted. Just waiting for the strikes to end, which actually sounds like a worse dumpster fire already. Um, so yeah, season two has been commissioned and it's already been scripted. So yeah, um, it's just a question of how long will the strikes go on? The word yeah. seems to be until next year. So that's uh, it's going to be a long one, I think, and it's going to cause a lot of long term problems. Uh, Jeff Romadix says, "Drinker, have you or Moller seen Paths of Glory? If so, what are your thoughts of it?" Uh, yeah, I have seen it, and I've done a review on it on my second channel. Why does nobody know go. about my second channel? Like I've got a whole bunch of reviews there that I've done. Guys, uh, you know well, these these streams they go on the second channel. <laughs> like you, there's a lot of them there. There's a lot of bonus stuff. There's a lot of reviews. He, he, he does a bunch of things. You should check it out. In the same yeah, vein, my, you should check out my, my second my, channel too. Yeah, check out Moller's second channel, Mooler, uh, and mine because like it's it's a combination of like re-uploads of like clips from these live streams and the full things and also smaller reviews of older films so whereas my main channel reviews might be like 10 15 minutes long these ones are like five or six or seven minutes uh and it's like older movies more obscure stuff like yeah there's a lot of stuff there um so yeah paths of glory is one of those that i've done it's obviously an absolutely classic stanley kubrick movie um it's about as anti-war as you can get it points out the absolute insanity and hypocrisy of the the first world war um and yeah it's an absolute fantastic movie um i can't recommend it highly enough so yeah go and watch my review or more importantly just go and watch the movie instead yeah (laughs) um not kevin feige says in spaceballs yogurt yoda mentions uh a sequel spaceballs to the search for more money wouldn't it be perfect <laughs> if someone made this mocking disney star wars yep absolutely mm-hmm. um liam khan says since you all like one piece you need to start reading the manga it's it is a lot but once you get into it you'll be instantly hooked and wanting more thank it's you a bit of an undertaking though it's a yeah enormous source material and of what i gather 20, from chat, 25 years of it uh a part of why the pacing is so what people describe i think is fairly as strong in in uh one piece the adaptation is that it's taking a lot of stories and throwing them all in instead of spacing it out apparently like the uh source does so apparently it's a bit slower um which is okay, you know, that could it could be strong as well, but it's, um, I'm seeing a lot of trepidation about it, and surprisingly, I saw people saying that some people prefer the live action to the source, which mm-hmm. uh, you never you never see people saying that about an anime fucking adaptation. Yeah. Uh, Piston says, meanwhile, in a parallel universe, EFAP, is that a porn thing? Uh, we're going to watch the grand uh, the return of Grand Admiral Thrawn versus Han, Luke, and Leia. I can't wait. That would have been an interesting thing in a parallel universe for sure. Um, Who done it says Moller and Drinker and Panel. What is your video creation process? Please give tips for a new channel trying to be entertaining and engaging. How do you script or edit? Crikey, that's a, um, a big one. I'm trying to think of how to answer that quick ishly. <laughs> like uh, Real quick, Moller. You, know, you watch the thing, take all the notes of every thought you're having, and then you look over those notes and filter out the shit ones, the ones that sort of add together, like. So you notice something in the first, second, and third act are all individual, and you're like, oh, shit. That's something they did several times. That's a pattern I've noticed about the writers slash creators. And you can make, you know, what kind of point do you want to make about the overall thing? What uh, what theme do you think is present throughout the story? What things you think they're doing well? What things you think they're not? And it depends on what kind of video you're making, like what kind of pacing you want to go for. If you're drinker, you're looking at like 10 to 15 minutes. If you're me, 10 to 15 hours. And uh, <laughs> you make sure you uh, cover what you want to cover, you know? uh redraft yeah 
I mean, for me, like my my approach is like, okay, what's my angle on this movie or TV show? Like, what what's the point I want to get across? How do I bring that into my intro? Then how how do I like you know summarize the plot in a reasonably concise way? Particularly if it's something that's good that I want to praise, like I then it tends to be shorter because I don't want to spoil things for people. I just want to give a general idea of like what happens in this, what's the setup, um, and then talk in more vague terms about uh, why I liked it or why I didn't like it or whatever. Um, if it's if it's something I'm criticizing and I generally like really dislike, okay, I'm not going to give a shit about spoiling it for people. I can go into all the detail I want and then I can really pick it apart and then it tends to be a bit longer. Uh, and then finish up with something that just ties into my initial theme of like, what is the the point that I'm trying to get across with this review? Um, so that's my my process. Like I try to turn it into like a mini character arc for the 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 reader or the the viewer you know they get taken on a little journey here's my premise here's the reasons why i like i get there and like here's what i conclude at the end that ties into my initial idea um which probably makes it sound a lot more intellectual than it really is but you know that's, that's my thought process uh a chernobog says one piece uh the show is like if you made lord of the rings books into one movie instead of three how much character and world building would you lose i'm happy that the show came out so well uh but still frustrated to see how limited they are by adapting so much content to one season but i'm happy with adaptation aside i mean i think you should be generally like they seem to have done a pretty good job with this one mm -hmm. there's always going to be more i think that you can work into it um particularly when you're dealing with a manga that's like you know dozens if not hundreds of issues at this point and it's been going for decades um but i'm fine with them just cherry picking the best ideas and like putting that into a nice concise story uh as long as the quality is good I'm, I'm pretty happy um what's the next one rrtnz says hail drinker Hard to say who's more wooden, Hayden Christensen or Rosario Dawson. Totally squandered a chance for real pathos in episode five. Why not restore balance with a drinker top five about some good films? Be the change. Uh, well, I mean, that's kind of why I do like the drinker recommends and why I do the extra shot series. Um, literally dozens, if not hundreds of films at this point that I've recommended. But uh, yeah, with this one, I honestly think Hayden Christensen has come along quite a bit as an actor. When I compare his performance here to what he was like in the um, episode two, you know he's he's matured quite a bit and he's he's not bad. It'd be nice to Despite... give him something more to do. Yeah, it would be, but like plastic CGI face aside, I think it's uh, he's he's got a bit more nuance to him now. And when it comes to the lightsaber fights, the action scenes, man, he has not missed a beat. Like he has still got it absolutely, and in a way, it's to the show's detriment because it makes Rosario Dawson look like a fucking brick in comparison. She's so slow and so awkward and clumsy. Yeah, it's uh, got old woman vibes with her movements. While he's uh, he's not like like you said, he hasn't skipped a beat. He knows exactly what he's doing. But she's not old. That's the thing. Like what she <laughs> early forties. Like she should be capable of more than this. It's. I don't know, maybe she's just not very coordinated. Maybe, you know, some people just aren't good at fight choreography. It doesn't matter what you do with them. I'm not sure what it is, but like, yeah, he just looks really good in comparison to her. And it's a real shame because you need to be, you need to be kind of rooting for her at this point. Uh, Cirrhosis of Liver says, hello, drinker. What's some particularly powerful alcohol that you've tried? Do you typically take your drinks neat, uh, on the rocks, etc.? So, the general, um, the general wisdom with this is if you're going to have malt whiskey, you shouldn't have it on the rocks because when you lower the temperature of the whiskey, it takes some of the flavor away from it. Uh, so, yeah, you should probably just have it neat. Um, the strongest alcohol, the alcohol, <laughs> alcohol, <laughs> um, clearly I've had a lot of it this evening, um, that I've ever had would probably be a toss-up between absinthe, which is like, I don't know, that's about 50 or 60%. Or cask strength whiskey, which is about the same. Um, I think the cask strength whiskey just tastes stronger. The absinthe is uh, is just as powerful, but it doesn't uh, it doesn't hit you initially quite as strong. Uh, but it does get you a few minutes later when it really kicks in. 
Um, so either of those, you're talking about 60%, I would say alcohol is, is probably the strongest stuff I've had. I don't know. When when you get beyond that, then you're into moonshine territory, I think, and that's not the sort of stuff you want mm. to go into because that's when you start losing your eyesight and shit. Oh, who needs it? Um, I, I suppose I should ask you as well, Mott, or like what's, what do you think is the strongest alcohol you've had in your time? I think I had absinthe once and I was like, <laughs> hmm. <laughs> <laughs> this this uh, doesn't compute very well. No, I, I'm... I usually like something to chase anything that's like as hard as something like absinthe or even, you know, 40% even. I, uh, yeah. They can burn. Yeah. I mean, I can always tell if it's something like really strong because it generates hiccups and you're like, oh <laughs> shit. Or when it's repeating on me like this and I'm getting heartburn from it, it's it's been good. It's good stuff. Strong stuff. Um, but I think honestly, beyond like forty five percent, it's not fun to drink anymore. Like you don't get a good taste from it or anything. It just fucking burns your. Insides. Oh, we all know what the goal is if you go with that high percentages. <laughs> I, I think so, yeah. And you have to ask yourself, like, is it worth it? Like, I would rather, like, I'm going to be fucked up by the end of the night for sure. But I, I at least want to enjoy the process of getting there. Yeah, have some nice taste in alcohol along the way. And like, we all know at the prime and peak of like getting drunk, you want to drink more. It's just it just comes with yeah. it. And so if you've started with absinthe, <laughs> you're probably not going to be able to go much further. Yeah, but then you're into like, can I just get some medical? Like medicine, medicinal <laughs> yeah. rubbing alcohol or something. Like it's just 100 percent alcohol. Um, the next one, RRTNZ says the atom bomb was invented in the summer of 1945. However, the most powerful U.S. weapon was invented on March 10th, 1940, the day Chuck Norris was born. Yeah, you know, mm. and the world has never been the same. I heard he once went to the Virgin Islands actually for holiday. No, it's just called the islands. That's what Chuck Norris does to them. It's a beautiful, beautiful joke. Yeah. Uh, Normie says, greetings. If given the choice between listening to the Stephen Colbert, Jimmy Fallon, Jimmy Kimmel, John Oliver, and Seth Meyers podcast, or sticking an ice pick in your ear, which ear would you choose? Yeah, I would, I would do both of them probably rather than listen to those guys. Yeah. Yeah, just get it done in it. I'm getting real like imagine vibes with Gal Gadot and stuff from from these dudes. This is like we are so fucking out of touch we don't even know who our audience is anymore and we are yeah, we're just desperate to have something. You know, just anything, any way of like being online or like available yeah, for yeah. people to listen to. That's what we're trying to do and yeah, Fuck those guys. Like, no one gives a shit about them anymore. Uh, you are yesterday's news, gentlemen. Um, Iron Mandrill says, just got out of the 50 sub club. Uh, RIP Jared Genesis memes. What? <laughs> Anyways, guys, keep up the great work. Looking forward to many more open bars and EFAPs. Is Hell Jared yeah. Genesis still a thing, by the way? I need to ask. I'm not sure. Why? Do oh, come on. He launched EFAP essentially. He was in the Patrick first Williams. episode, it's true. He is, he is, those two guys are like deep lore for EFAP. I feel like you should always know what their current status is. Well, I mean, I sort of lost interest after the time where he threatened to kill his dad on the stream. <laughs> <What if? laughs> Who is that, Patrick Williams or Jared? No, the, or he was, he was like, he was being trolled and he like, he lost it. It was like a viral video. He was uh, furious. He wanted to stab people. Jesus. You know, it stops being as fun when, <laughs> like, it gets to that point. When mental illness starts to take hold, it's like, ah, oh, oh, okay, absolutely, we dude. stop on this guy next. If there's one piece of advice I give anybody in the internet, when someone starts getting mentally ill, like, move away, leave them alone, let them do whatever the hell they're doing, just, just get on with your stuff. Yeah, I think that's fair play. Uh, Marky Mark says, what are your guys' thoughts on the Expendables movies? I know they weren't good, but they've been a guilty pleasure for mine. Um, yeah, I'm fine with them. Like I, and the yeah. same, I'm in the same boat of like, yep, yeah, I can recognize that they are not like quality cinema or anything, but fuck it, they're fun to see. Uh, it's fun to see all these action heroes from my childhood interacting with each other. Yeah, we well, just crossover we wanted. 
Arnie's like, I'll be back. And then Bruce Willis is like, no, you'll always, you'll always be back. I'm, I'm going to be back. And then Arnie's like, you'd be Kaye. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's so, so kind of, stupid. But it's so absurd, yeah. It, again, as, the, as, as kids in the 90s, that was the crossover you always wanted. You wanted to see Stallone and Schwarzenegger and Bruce Willis and Jean-Claude Van Damme and, you know, maybe if Steven Seagal, if you were a fucking weirdo in one movie just kicking ass together it was yeah. it was good this last um, uh this number four seems like a um sort of the the flame is almost extinguished sort of thing i think this is it yeah it's like passing it on to the next generation of like out of date action heroes yeah i think they they could have done something i genuinely i think they could have had fun with like picking the the female action stars you know, if they got Mila Jovovich and Angelina Jolie and I don't know, Selma Hayek and whoever else uh, and yeah. had them do something like that, you could have probably made that work as well. And, you know, fucking hell, create an extended universe, have them team up at some point. Um, For a movie called Expendables, they didn't kill many main characters ever, did they? No, they weren't. They weren't all that expendable, as it <laughs> turns out. Uh, it's probably like... It, it probably was a good concept for one movie. I don't know if they needed to make four of them, but <laughs> hey-ho. Yeah. Um, Krusty Jugglers says, Ahsoka has bits of everything wrong with Star Wars. Cas character assassination, unlikable and thin characters in general, bonkers nonsense plot, themes that don't fit the events of the show, fan baiting and swill dialogue. Yuck. Yep. Can't argue with that. Can't argue with it. Nope. Um, Oluk a bird says it's not often I day drink on a Thursday, but I've had enough thinking. Uh, sorry, I've had enough to think about giving money to streamers is a good idea. Thank you, man. Uh, here's a few dollars for many hours of entertainment that you've given me. Well, we do our best to entertain, so thanks, man. Uh, it will go towards the critical doggo. Um, one day we'll actually make him conscious. Who knows? Uh, uh, David Lamplough says. Oda has been writing One Piece since 1997. Damn. Uh, weekly chapters and even while in hospital from overwork would still keep writing. Uh, that is how much it means to him. He would never give up creative control. Hmm. That's an artist right there. Who cares about his work. <clears throat> like, damn, he was hospitalized for overwork. Like, geez. Yeah. Um, he says, also, the actors really knew their lore too uh, and are all mega fans. Sanji's actor really learned to cook and kickbox and he would also cook for the crew all the time as practice. The little things that fans notice. That is cool. You've got to admit, that's pretty fucking cool. Sure. Um, Grimnak says, Mauler has a lurker with a crazy hate boner, I see. I'm, I guess. I'm sure I have many. Yeah. As the drinker, <laughs> we get these... Uh... A wonderful life with the internet. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Dragon Paul Z says started Buffy a few weeks ago. Just got to season three. Uh, some cringe here and there, but the small nuggets of touching moments have kept me hooked for more. Well, now you're <laughs> into the season one and two are the ones you got to get past. Then season three is pretty strong. Four is a bit rocky, and then five, six, seven, you're uh, in the clear. And then make sure to watch Angel too. Don't sleep on that. Is good, good advice. Uh, Angry Batman says, working, uh, working my way through Ghost Target and loving it. Uh, Moa's insults in his Ant-Man video were epic. Thanks to you both for making the world fun again. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. You've got some great insults, I will say. Um, Blue Collar Loser says, did you see any ads for the new Nick Cage movie? I'm going now. Why? Because it's goddamn Nick Cage. I made my first five dollars thanks to you. Uh, here it is, man. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, man. And uh, yeah, good to see you doing so well. Um, I'm not sure what the new Nick Cage movie is. There's like five every month or something at this point, but yeah, I'll need to take a look. Uh, Taylor Ramirez says I started watching One Piece because I couldn't believe that Mauler and Drinker recommended it. A live action Netflix anime is fun. What universe did I stumble into and why is Star Wars still crap? <laughs> Good questions. Yeah, we're living in bizarre world right now. What would make it even more bizarre is if they made a good Star Wars show. Oof. 
who knows? Like, what if Acolyte turns out to be the best Star Wars that we've ever oh, seen? Yeah, it could happen. Yeah, you don't know. You don't. There's know no reason to think there. otherwise. Gosh, but, I mean, They've hey, Andor season right two, people. right? We'll get that one day. They've got all the right people working on it. That's the important yeah. thing. Um, Weirdo with a cello says, "No way ho uh, home." Wrote his characters well, treating them right and giving them a good send off. Hollywood learned uh, that they should stuff their movies full of cameos and hope for the best. I wonder if they'll learn from One Piece. Yeah, that's that's kind of the question that we asked ourselves earlier. Probably they won't. They'll take all the wrong lessons from it, but that's just kind of what they do. Um, Weirdo with a cello also says, except Doctor Strange, we don't talk about him. More don't talks we? about him, though. I talk about him for like six hours, yeah. yeah. Uh, Evan Rose says, one Piece has been a major part of my whole life. It released the year after my birth, started to read in elementary school, and still read new releases over a decade later now. Love that is being well received as live action. Yeah, good. And uh, yeah, it must be nice to see that happen. Um, Casey Boyd says One Piece world building is second only to Tolkien. Damn, that's a high benchmark. Mm. LW says Hail Bar, two more MFKs for you. So murder have carnal relations with or um end uh one Halle Berry Michelle Pfeiffer and Anne Hathaway or two Amber Heard JJ Abrams and a moldy bowl of spaghetti with Fermunda okay so the good first of all marry uh screw and uh and kill so Michelle Pfeiffer. probably marry Wait. Anne, right? She's the youngest out of the three, so nah. Like, well, let, let's go for them in their peak. So I would probably oh, okay. marry Halle Berry, uh, screw Michelle Pfeiffer, and kill Anne Hathaway. I think that's the only reasonable suggestion there. I could and... see myself being convinced to trade Pfeiffer and Berry, but maybe sure, fine. They're they're quite close, yeah. Um, Anne Hathaway, I definitely kill her. <laughs> <laughs> even if i wasn't forced to it's like wow let's do it um but yeah as for the other ones uh so we've got amber heard jj abrams and a moldy bowl of spaghetti uh i'd probably marry the spaghetti yeah um, yeah easy amber heard and then kill it jj abrams i think no that practically answered itself there you go hmm it's reasonable uh, Casey Boyd says Thanos was a decent villain. He wasn't fleshed out properly. He's half eternal, half deviant, so that's why he wipes out half of all life. The Eternals also should have been slowly introduced before Infinity War. Makes sense. I I, I can't argue with that. Um, also, yeah. thoughts on Luke Cage and the Defenders? Phase four makes Defenders look like Casablanca. I also like Luke Cage. Um, I didn't mind Luke Cage. I I thought he was a bit bland i think he could have used a bit more spark to his personality um he just always seemed a bit not passive but just uh you know we just needed more from him i think um particularly con considering the the kind of uh powers that he had essentially he's invulnerable um yeah you could have done more with that um but yeah when i look at luke cage's show now yeah it's it's pretty good compared to like really anything that marvel have put out since then um i'll do a couple more and then finish up um, timothy finch says can't wait for the 10 hour efap responding to yms re reacting to Azzy's rant funny how the the title randomly changed from him uh from calling him a moron to a man oh did he you changed it from moron to man interesting um no, I don't. I got no plans to cover the. I'm not doing that again. Uh, that, that was a exercise in patience. That was was the. I'd rather talk about movies. I like talking about movies. We're talking about. Can we? Can we? Videos. Yeah, chat. Can we give some mall or some kind of like appreciation for like just going on that like a nine hour stream with YMS about all this? Like, just you know, you press press F to pay respects to Mauler. And the rest of the <laughs> EFAP crew just for the work that they put in on this one because they absolutely deserve it. I'm actually going to wait to see if this comes through. I still will always prefer to just talk about movies and TV with you. That's, yep. the, that's the preferred environment, right? 
There you go. There's a whole lot of Fs in chat for you guys. So there you go. The, the, the chat is paying respect to you and the, the boys of EFAP. Nice We one. appreciate it. Um, Samson the Mighty says, Drinker and Panel, what is a movie that you love to start and finish in the Halloween season? One movie to start and mm. one movie to finish. Go. I I don't quite do it that way, so but I guess uh, hmm, what kicks it off and what gives it a good ending? I can I can uh, sort of help. Go for well, it. I can go while while you're thinking if that's any help. Uh, so to to finish, I would probably be the thing. Uh, absolutely classic horror movie, and I don't know, man. the The ending of that just seems like a very definitive ending for any movie. Um, so that's how I tend to round out my Halloween season. Hmm. And to start, oh, man, it might be. It's generally between Nightmare on Elm Street, um, or Halloween. Or potentially Event Horizon. Any of those three movies would get me started off in the Halloween season and get me right into the spirit of things. Yeah, I mean, I, like I said, I, I wouldn't disagree with any of those choices. I just don't. Uh, I, don't I put. I could have said like I'd start with the things. It's just fucking like one of the best horror movies of all time. What a you know hit the ground running. But uh, maybe the answer should answer the form of what ones I'd like to see because uh, you know it's always fun to rewatch like Alien and stuff. But this this month. We've got uh, the tenth Saw movie is coming. Yeah, and uh, oh, just you know, who isn't a huge fan of the Saw franchise, right? Everyone, obviously. So that'll it be really, fun. It lifts my spirits. That's what I like about the Saw movies. Yeah, I oh, feel yeah. good about humanity after I watch them. It's like watching Hostel. I just like, they're, yeah. they're all about nice. you know cherishing life. That's what they're all about. So there are several references in each of the films to Jigsaw's not a murderer. He's not a killer. He just offers people choices. That's all he does. Yeah. I mean, the choices are quite violent and bloody, but, you know, they're Who's, there. Really, that's just a matter of perspective. Every choice we make is violent and bloody in some way. I, I want to watch Tucker and Dale versus Evil because people in chat were recommending it there. We, and it's like, I haven't seen it yet. and I We need have to watch, to watch that together, okay? You're not allowed to watch yeah. that without me. I love <laughs> I that movie. I would definitely do it. Um, what was the other one? The, the, did you ever watch a movie called Severance? Yes, long time ago though. Yeah, and it's like a kind of British. They put a foot in a like a cooler, movie, right? But... Yeah, well, it's like a team building exercise out in the woods or something. Like you know, they start getting picked off by like serial killers and stuff. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I I remember quite enjoying it. I quite liked uh, Severance. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Well, yeah, I would happily watch Tucker and Dale with you. Sweet, you nice. Um, I'm probably going to finish it up there though because we've we've still got a bunch of super chats there. Obviously, we didn't get through them all tonight, but we will absolutely tackle them on our super chat catch up um, on Sunday night. We always do it. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. um, a few people in chat were asking as well, like where do we re-upload these live streams once they're done? They always go to my second channel, Critical Drinker After Hours. So if Hell you're looking for any of the yeah. stuff there, yeah, we'll we'll I'll generally put like short clips of like specific things that we've covered uh and then the entire stream if people want to rewatch it or whatever they missed it at the time so it's always going to be on critical drinker after hours uh that's where you can find it um and for people that uh haven't got it yet i was just going to say the more vinyl plush oh no is they're gone available. oh are they finished now <laughs> yeah they finished. oh I thought you still had a couple of days no no they they, uh, they actually ended like right before the open bar started up um, oh okay no, i'm sorry then. i ignore my comment on that one then. no it's all good uh, we should take the opportunity to talk about the uh the doggo plushie right oh yeah yeah the critical drinker doggo plushie is uh is still available um it's going to be up for another two weeks or something for pre-orders we've already sold like i don't know 15 1600 of them yeah so crazy good stuff doing, yeah it's doing fantastic and all of the proceeds like basically none of the none of the profits of this are going to me i'm going to donate it all to like my local greyhound rescue sh uh, shelter so it's going to help like these uh these dogs get rehomed um and keep them going and basically until they they find new owners so uh, it's a good cause it's a worthy cause you don't have to buy the plushies or anything if you just want to help out the shelter uh, i put the link um on my previous videos so you can catch it there but anyway 
I won't pl- I won't plug it too hard, but I want to say thank you to everyone that's joined us tonight. Um, thank you for all the generous super chats, and thank you to all the people that have joined up as new members of the of Critical Drinker. Um, we're adding more and more emojis and like benefits for those uh, for those different levels. Um, now that like it's actually like bulked out, and YouTube will let us do stuff. So uh, stay tuned for that. Um, and yeah, thank you to my mods that have done their usual sterling work um, this evening. I appreciate you guys. And uh, we will catch you on the next open bar stream. So that is all we've got today. So we're going to go away now. Bye.